All right, here we go. Van Lathan, welcome back. What's up? I'm good to be back, bro. I love Lat TV. Man. Thank you. We love having you here yeah. as well. Well, you actually called me the other day about the Boosie situation. I did. And this is why you're actually here, because you were very concerned about everything that, that was happening over there. And uh, what's interesting is actually I've been on the phone with this lawyer uh -huh. starting last night. And he kind of filled me in in terms of what's happening. So for everyone that knows the story but doesn't know the whole story, Boosie had a video shoot in San Diego. And he was arrested afterwards with a gun. Uh, now, everyone thought, well, he's got security. Why is he being arrested for the gun and his security is not and so forth? So after uh, some information came out, apparently at the video shoot, he had a what seemed to be a gun uh, in his back mm -hmm. during the video shoot. So he was arrested. He was booked. And according to his lawyer, the state, because it was a state case at that point, the judge agreed to give him probation, no jail time. So okay. he showed up to court thinking that he was going to basically fill out some forms and walk away. But what had happened was, I guess the, the district attorney was upset over the judge's decision. So he called the feds and the feds picked up the case. Okay, what grounds do the feds have to make it a federal case? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, the feds could pick up a case or they could not pick up a case. It's really up to discretion. According to the lawyer, he feels that Boosie's being targeted because of his views about law enforcement and so forth, which he has been consistent on for the last, whatever, 25 years. Right. So what I'm interested to know is um, what, that's the thing that's interesting. What, uh, interesting, should I say, what specifically has gotten the feds involved? Because this is what I'm, this is what I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. And obviously, We've talked about Boosie, or I've talked about Boosie on here before. And there are things that Boosie has said and did that I'm not even going to begin to defend, right? And that's just the reality. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to act like he's not a son of Baton Rouge, somebody that I have knew in high school, have known for a long time. Um, and that there's not a soft spot for him in terms of me and the city where I'm from. And to be honest with you, just that type of dude, you know, that came from the places that he came from and was just still able to turn his life into something positive for himself and for his family. Yeah. And so for me, and people don't know when they say, when, you know, when you talk about across the tracks, like where he's from, I was just in Baton Rouge. I was just at home. I took Kalika over there. And we drove down the river road, turned on West Roosevelt, drove up. I'm showing her South Baton Rouge and all the area where I'm from. And like, as we were driving through, I see five, six dudes come out of a car, or out of a house, I say, they all got guns, they got ski masks on, they're going to meet a car. I mean, it's just, it, 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 we just happen to drive right by it. If, if I call on the phone right now, she'll tell you. I'm telling you, it's real down there. And so to see somebody make it out and, and have a family and have all of these things going for themselves, I want a reason why he has to go away right now. To me, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I get that there are a whole bunch of people who see some of the disgusting things that I that he said and feel like this is score settling. I would caution all black people right now not to ever be in a position where you're okay with the American government settling scores with black people because it's never going to work out in uh, on, in, in our benefit. So to me. I want to know as much about the case as possible yeah. because it seems like he's being targeted. And if he's being targeted based upon what he said uh, uh, about law enforcement, then that's even more problematic because number one, as an artist and number two, as a citizen of this country, you should be able to have whatever opinion, either that, uh, that opinion be affirming or dissenting about law enforcement or their treatment of your people as possible. So I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the, the hyper prosecution of so many people in the last five or six years. And this doesn't make any sense to me, Vlad. I'm going to be honest with you. So based on my conversation with his lawyer, this seemed to be a relatively easy case because it was a gun charge, but Boosie doesn't have a history of violent arrests. His last arrest was for like marijuana, yeah. like 11, 12 years ago. He's off probation. He's a law-abiding citizen. 
He has a big family. He contributes to the community and so forth. And it was essentially supposed to be just probation. And out of nowhere, the feds came and arrested him. And he was actually given bond by the judge a few days ago. And then last night, we got a phone call from his lawyer and, and someone else in his camp that basically said that the feds filed a motion to stop his bond and keep him in jail. Right. And luckily, I just found out from his lawyer that the judge actually sided with Boosie and Boosie is getting bond. Right. But the fervor that the feds are going through to lock him up, keep him in jail. You know, he had a bunch of shows laid out, obviously, because he's always doing shows. He's yeah. always grinding and always hustling. I mean, he really hustles more than anyone I know, yeah. honestly. And I, I know a lot of very rich people and no one works as hard as Boosie. Boosie touches down and he's he's getting money, you know, versus walkthroughs, interviews, right. <laughs> endorsements, commercials, right. whatever you want to do. You got some cash. Boosie's with it. He shows up. He's professional. Mm -hmm. He doesn't rush you. He he does his job, he collects his check, and then he goes on to his next gig. The question is, even when you tell me that, there seems to be a reason that the feds want Boosie in prison. Yeah. Why do the feds want Boosie in prison so bad? Like, what is it about this type of, there's so many things, so many people out there that are doing, that are just dripping in criminality, doing actual real harm. Boosie right now is more of a personality than he is even a rapper at this point. He's still dropping music, but he's more known for what he says now mm -hmm. when there's no beat playing. Like, why are they trying to put this man in jail? Like, why are they really trying to put this man in prison? And I know a lot of times, man, you know, we look at this stuff and when we're sitting down uh, in our chairs, it looks like a video game. It looks like it's not real life. And I just wonder sometimes how many of these people that something happens to somebody and they go away, I wonder how many of these people have ever sat on the other side of a window and seen somebody that, they're, that like, they love incarcerated. And I'm not talking about a situation where someone's harmed, actually harmed, where you might've pulled out a gun and shot at somebody or where you've really inflicted. I'm talking about in situations like this, where this seems to be something that had a solution but now they're going the extra, extra, extra mile. And when the feds pick this up, it's a possibility that he go got he got to go sit down for three or five years. And that's three or five years where he ain't hustling, where he away from his family. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost a shit ton of money. Mm -hmm. And like in that situation, when people are rooting for incarceration or for people to be gone, I always wonder if they're really understanding the level that it has to rise to for that to be the only thing that we can do at that point. If you hurt somebody, if you took somebody's child, if you hurt one of our sisters, if you, I saw a dude that uh, I posted on my Instagram that robbed the elderly woman at the yeah, 18. He actually just got caught. Okay, I'm happy that he got caught. Me too. Because he need to go sit his motherfucking ass down for a little while. Agreed. Okay? Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about situations like this where it doesn't seem to be anybody in danger, what the fuck is the point of, of putting this man in jail? In prison, like people, if you ever seen somebody in prison before, it, especially he in his forties now, it just I don't get it. I don't he's, get it. Uh, I think he's forty. He's forty, so he's he's forty now. So this is a very pivotal time for for his family for whatever, bro. I just to me, I look at it, I get it. I saw a lot of people celebrating it. I understand that people have their issues with people have people were celebrating people. Boosie getting locked up. They were. Mm. There were people that were celebrating Boosie getting locked up. I mean, but look, here's the thing. There's people right now that are happy that the motherfuckers can't get out the submarine because they're rich. They paid $250,000 to go on the stupid-ass fucking submarine and go find the Titanic, dumbest thing I ever heard of. My karma doesn't allow for me to, like, have a bunch of fun and make jokes and laugh about that. Are there a bunch of stupid white motherfuckers and whoever that went down there and got... They are. They are. But the only thing that my mind thinks about 
is I think about like five people, one of whom is only 19 years old because it's the guy's son. Right, so father and son. Father and son. I think about five people suffocating to death in a metal tube at the bottom of the ocean. I just can't find the laughs. I get it. I understand it. I'm not playing holier than now, but my anxiety too bad. And so that's the same way when I think about somebody being in prison, being being in what that does to someone. I'm not saying that they're not consequences for things that some people do, but I'm saying in this particular case, this just doesn't seem right. It, it seems like he's got a target on his back. Well, yeah. And, you know, based on the state case, it was just going to be probation. Boosie, in all the years I've known him, and, you know, if the authorities are listening to this, you can go ahead and play this in court. I have, in the 20 years I've known Boosie, I've never seen guns around. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it on him. I've never seen it lying around. He's never brandished it. He never, you know joked about it or, or, or waved it around uh, John Morant style. Sure. Nothing, 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 nothing. He's always been responsible. He's always been professional. In this situation, it appears like he just had it there for his own protection. And that's it. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got threatened with it. That There was no incident. It just so happened that the area that he was in, I guess, was a crip area. And the cops were watching one of the guys that were in the area and they saw the video on IG Live. The cops saw the video on IG Live and then they go Boosie. And then, and then then they're like, oh, who's this? Oh, this is Boosie. So then they went to Boosie's IG Live and they're seeing the same thing. So then they went and got a helicopter, figured out where they were to track their position. So then once they all got in the car and drove off, they pulled the car over. Then they found the guns that were allegedly, you know, That don't on sound IG convenient Live. to you. That don't, I mean, even convenient from a standpoint, that would have me looking around at who around me. Just that, that seems, that, Cir that group of circumstances right there. Oh, it could have been that very series of events. It could have been very easily an a, a informant situation. It, it right? Seems it seems like, like, it like look, okay, look, I got these cases on me right now. I'm facing a, a robbery charge. I'm facing five years. Oh, okay. I got this famous rapper over here. Let me call my my cop friend. You know, I'm saying, hey, listen. Can you make those five go away? I'll give you a rapper with I'll a gun you, right I'll now. I'll give you a big I'll fish. I'll give you a it, big fish. It to to have a allegedly have like a, a gun tucked in your your waistband or whatever and for that to then turn around and end up being something that gets you a federal charge I would be very surprised if all of that's just accidental if that just kind of happened because somebody was surfing IG at a specific time right according to his lawyer what's weird about this is that usually a federal charge happens before a verdict or a plea deal yeah. You see what I'm saying? So the fact that the judge gave him probation and then the feds picked him up is very strange because usually it'll happen during the course. There'll be a superseding indictment and then the feds will take over the entire case before there's any verdict or whatever else. But the fact that he was essentially let go with probation and I don't know, I guess it hurt the prosecutor's feelings, made him angry. So then he then called the feds up to go and pick up a whole, you know, this case, essentially drop the initial case and pick up a whole new case. It's crazy and it's sad. Um, but luckily, at least he's got bond. Yeah. You know, 50000 is an amount that, you know, he has pretty quickly. It's not going to be a problem. He's going to at least be out and he's going to be able to fight his case outside the prison, outside the jail. I, I, and if... And he'll be able to probably do shows and make money and so forth. To help pay for his, his, help his, pay legal, for his legal defense. Stuff right. like that. I, I like, but if Boosie can hear me right now, I would, I would give him a message and I would say this. Do not antagonize the federal government in any way. Yeah. Do not antagonize them. What I've seen from a lot of people, um, and I'm not fucking with Tory Lanez because I think everything that's happening to him, just to be honest with you, I think he deserves it. I agree. I'm just, I've been saying that. Yeah. So I've, I've been so, saying that for a year and a half. So everything that's happening to him, I think he deserves it. But, but what I will say is that, you know, that's somebody that didn't help themselves prior to whatever sentencing is going to happen because to continuously antagonize the legal system, mm -hmm. especially after there's already been a verdict rendered, yeah. and to continuously do that. Calling them racist, 
whatever it they're, is. They're, they're purposely trying to send a black man, to, an innocent black man to prison. No, and none and of that's so happening right here. You have a victim who says that she was shot. Yes. Okay. So none of that got on the stand and said, that's the man who shot me, who shot me. Okay. So none of that's happening in that situation. That's not what's going on in this situation. We have to be, what I would say is it's important for people, Boosie himself and people around to consider the stakes here. If you're talking about three, five years in jail, straight up, it's gotta be almost professional in the way that it's done. Deal with the government the way you deal with the government. Shouldn't be no whole bunch of talking about the government. Let other people advocate. People like myself who think this is unfair or other people advocate for the fact that you're being treated the way that you're being treated. And don't give these people any reason to even go harder than they're already going. Don't mute yourself or cut your nuts off for nobody. As black men, we can't do that. But what I'm saying in this situation right here is... There's plenty of voices out there who know that this is a fucked up situation. And I would just caution against antagonizing the feds right now when they're acting so irrationally already. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Because in the Tory Lane situation, he antagonized the the prosecutor. Yeah. He left a whole voicemail and, and so forth. And, and him and his lawyer were basically calling them racist and crooked and corrupt and, and so forth. And ultimately, what did they do? They said, OK, they went and submitted paperwork for harsher guidelines mm -hmm. for Tory. Right. He's facing like a minimum of nine. They recommended 13. Right. Now, the judge could do what the judge wants to do, but. They've antagonized the the prosecutor, you know, the dis, you know, assistant DA. They've they've they try to get the judge kicked off the case. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? They're antagonizing everyone, and these are the people who have Tory's life in their hands. And they for, have more power than Tory. And for All me, Tory could do is talk. And for me, I'm looking at it like this: the very least in that situation, what I'm going to do as a man, the very least that I'm going to do, because I believe every word she said. But the very least that I'm going to do as, as a man right there is say, you know what? This entire situation was out of control. This entire situation was a group of people who demonstrated very poor judgment on that night. And I was one of those people. Yes. And there's a way that you come about that. There's a way that you go about that. But for whatever reason, in his case, he just went the other way and demonstrated a breathtaking lack of perspective and humility to me. Breathtaking. And I think that in the end, um, it, it costs them. In this situation right here, you there are plenty of people can, that can see how wrong this is. And there are plenty of people that can see that this is almost frivolous in a way. And I think it's probably important for Boosie to let those people speak for him and that he, he go into this situation with a clear and even killed mind and try to fight this because um, I think what's happening in the Boosie right now is some fucking bullshit. Yeah. I just, I really do. I agree. And it's not just because this is my friend and someone that I do business with. The courts were going to just give him probation. That's it. Yeah. That, was, that was the verdict by the judge. He was going to go in get his probation, sign his probation paperwork, stop smoking weed, right, <laughs> you right, know, right, right, and, right. you know, take his piss test and so forth. Because he was on probation for like 10 years yeah. already. Like of course, yeah, point. a long time. You know, he he got off uh, a few years ago. I remember how happy he was and everything else like that. But, okay, look, back on probation, fine. It is what it is, not the end of the world. Even that situation, Vlad, even the situation of perpetually having black men on probation, given somebody, probation is obviously something that's preferable to jail or to prison, right? Yeah. Obviously. But having somebody on probation for five, 10, like, see, 15 years of probation and continue, that's another way of carceral control over somebody's life. Right. Like, and so to have somebody in this, this weird purgatory of American... Um, freedom where they're on probation and don't have the same. I mean, all of that stuff. I would, well, I say all that to say that like, 
Like we need to get free of the controls and the shackles of the legal and carceral system over us. And in situations where somebody is going to go to jail, it has to be meaningful. You have to see somebody that's a danger to society. Yeah. And for all the shit that he said that's been fucked up, I don't feel like anyone can demonstrate right now that Boosie has been a danger to society. As a matter of fact, in uh, some, some of the scrapes that I've heard about him recently or in the last couple of years, he was the victim, if you really want to be honest about it. so Yeah, I mean, he got shot in Dallas. He got shot in Dallas, right? Yeah. So I, I haven't seen anything that demonstrates that Boosie is a danger to society. I'm not, I'm the bleeding heart liberal and everybody know me. I'm the hyper woke, like all of that stuff like that. I'm not to the point I can fuck with nobody say, well, I'm going to start rooting for the feds to put somebody in fucking jail when they didn't deserve it. I, I, I don't think he deserves this. I'll be honest with you. I agree. Free Boosie. Absolutely. Like I said, I have, uh, I've been talking to his lawyer the whole time. We've been reporting on it. People think that we're somehow hating on Boosie by reporting on what's happening. That's the exact opposite. Actually, we're working with his lawyer to try to get this information out there. Because like you said, Boosie probably shouldn't talk about this when he gets out. Right. He I probably would. he probably shouldn't, you know, vote. Don't ask him no questions about it either. Bro. I'm not going to ask him no questions about it. I'm actually pretty good about not talking about open cases. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. Why do you feel like people think that that, why do you feel like people, because like when you say that, people are going to be like, nah, man, Vlad be trying to set. Why, have, you, have you heard of a, a, a piece of Vlad footage being used in a case? I don't know. I don't find I that it. type of thing. I haven't. There's right. been there's been rumors and there's been fake news. And, you know, I remember there was a fake story about how Arab's judge personally thanked Vlad, which came from a fake article from a fake website, even though it trended and people like Quest Love's lame ass was retweeting it and so oh, forth. Oh, we love Quest Love. I don't love Quest Love. We love Quest Love. I don't love Quest Love. In fact, <laughs> I even DM'd him about it. He denied it that he even did it. And I sent him the screenshot that he did it and then he blocked me. He blocked you after that? Uh, he blocked me after. You beefing with Questlove, man? I'm not beefing with Questlove. I thought me and Questlove actually had a pretty good relationship. We we used to DM each other all the time. I've seen him when he was DJing. I said, what's up? Only to have him try to promote a fake article about somebody getting locked up and then denying it. You know what I'm saying? I, that's not a beef. That's just like, hey, how about, an, uh, you know, take responsibility for what you did and say, hey, sorry, I posted this and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't true as opposed to blocking me and then denying it. So- it is what it is with Questlove. But right. the whole thing is, is that when people have open cases, I don't talk about the case. What I may do is just say, hey, I know you have an open case. We're not going to talk about it. How do you feel? Like, how, what, are, what are you going through emotionally right now? If you look at my interview with the baby, he had an open murder case mm -hmm. when I interviewed him. Remember the whole uh, Walmart shooting? Of course. And I said, yo, you have an open case. So I'm not going to talk about it. He ended up beating the case. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to that type of thing, I'm very careful about it. Now, People think I'm the feds because I talk to people about their cases that they've already beat or they've already done their prison time for, right? Right? <laughs> people don't understand basic law. What? <laughs> what? Get it off his chest right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing this for 15 years now. It's like, okay, how many more times do we have to, do I have to reiterate myself? Like, seriously, seriously. Like, yo. Oh, he talked about, Sammy the Bull came in and talked about his murders. Yeah, because he took a plea deal for all his murders. See, but here's the thing about those guys. And I think this is a whole thing. Um, I think this is a whole thing that's like this internet period, but specifically with the mob guys that come in. What's the guy that made all the money off the oil racket? That you Michael Frenzies. Okay, so he said something that was so real about the mob guys when they do interviews. He said, if somebody comes in here and talks about a murder that they committed, he said, either they're lying or they're a rat. Yeah. So, or, or they did their prison time. But if they did their prison time and they're out here talking about a murder they committed on your show, mm -hmm. they probably turned informant. No, or they went to jail for a murder. They, they pled guilty or right. they were found guilty in court. They did their time and now they could talk about their murder. Okay, right? Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, a well, lot of times- you're still in prison. Like, for example, I, I interviewed the guy who was involved in the killing of Michael Jordan's father. He's still in prison. I didn't know those guys were still around. Yeah, there was two of them. Oh, yeah, I know there are two of them. But uh, any, but anyway, so, but I just think sometimes with, the, with those dudes, uh, these are stories, when I listen to those guys and I watch all of that shit, 
all of those, you know that. Mm -hmm. But when I listen to those guys, those are stories that they want to tell. To me, they, they for whatever reason, the mafia has been so romanticized. Mm -hmm. And this is really all over the place. I've never seen, Vlad, I've never been even close to what anybody could consider a street guy. Mm -hmm. That was never my thing. I was sitting right there when everybody was doing all of their stuff. And I'd be the one to be like, hey, bro, the police around the corner. Y'all better chill. Like, seriously, man. Like, that's that's that was me, right? Mm -hmm. I can't think of any entity ever that's had a rougher five years than the streets. The streets are flailing right now, bro. Mm -hmm. Almost every single thing that I understood to be true about the streets, as someone who had to know what the streets were about so that I didn't run afoul of any rules of code and conduct, conduct, right? So it's like, um, there's a verse, I forgot who said it, to, to be far from hood, but to understand the streets. Drake has that. Now, I don't know if it's necessarily true in Drake's situation. You know, Drake was a child star or whatever, but I'm sure that he does have an understanding of the streets, not dissing the Drake. But I'm saying you had to understand because you had to know whether or not, if you lived in a certain area or came from a certain place, you had to know what rules that you weren't supposed to break where you couldn't be, what you weren't supposed to be involved in, who was this, who was that, you still had to know. Everybody had to know, right? And so there was a respect there for all of those things. There was a respect there for the ethics that the, that the streets had because you realized that it was real, that there were real consequences, real guys, real women that were living their lives by a certain code. Man, if I was coming up now, I wouldn't know what was real and what was fake. I would, because you you see, you don't even know what snitching is anymore. Right. Like the, the the rules for snitching have gotten so complicated. It's like, nah, he didn't snitch. He didn't snitch because when he said it, it was after nine o'clock on a Wednesday. <laughs> and if you say it after nine o'clock on Wednesday, Technically, the cops is closed. Who is he really talking to? Did anybody go to jail after what he said? Sure, he named names, but who are those names? How do we know? Back in the day, it used to be like, if the cops said, where did they go? And you went that way, <laughs> you was a snitch. Well, yeah. Michael Franzese, I asked him if Gunna was a mafia member and he said what he said, what was on tape, uh -huh. what would happen? And Michael said he would be killed. Right. According to mafia rules, that's snitching. They don't care if, oh, well, you know, it doesn't affect anyone else. You got on the stand in front of a judge and you said that this is a criminal organization and I've seen people do acts and furtherance right. of the gang. Yeah. So, you know, th that's against every mafia rule that that that's there. And, and according to the mafia, he would have a price on his head. But- he just put out an album that went like number two, and you know, I love it. Hit songs. I like. I love it. I'm. Li hold it. Here's my thing. I don't care about any of it. The only reason why I had any understanding of street ethics is for my own safety. Mm -hmm. It's for my own safety. I remember one time we was playing basketball, and we playing basketball. We out there shooting. Everybody having a good time. It was one of those summer days, and one of the big homies said. Hey man, you know that boy right there that he, he be talking. I was like, man, talking to who? I wasn't even. He's like, he be talking, man. Just let you know that, like, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh well, <laughs> I'm not gonna be around him any longer. Not because I look down on him for being a snitch, but because if somebody come up with the bullshit, I don't wanna be there. Hmm. I don't wanna have anything to do with it. Zero bullshit, okay? So for me, the gunner thing, I love gunner. I'm gonna listen to gunner's music after. Niggas knew not to do a crime with me. I'm not going to jail for y'all. Let me tell you something else. I also think that some of this stuff, Vlad, is because of Instagram. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what I mean. So, let's say you're coming up in Baton Rouge, it's 1995. You know that being rich is good, but you don't know how good. All right? You know that having a lot of money is great, but you've never seen Tulum or Dubai or any of these places, right? So when you go to jail, you, you 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, you don't really have a concept of what you're missing out on. Mm. You don't. 
Yeah. Now, it's not just the rappers and people like that that are going to all of these different places. That life looks so good that I feel like a lot of times when people are in a situation where they have to decide whether or not they're going to adhere to the street codes, mores, ethics, and values that have existed for a long time, there is some there is a binary choice on the other side of it, and that is women twerking in Tulum. <laughs> and they're telling you, hey, you're going to jail for 10 years. But if you tell, you can deny it and you can be with women twerking in Tulum. <laughs> you could be swimming with dolphins. You could be at Nobu, all of this stuff. And these guys look at it. They say, oh, street code, women twerking. Street code, women twerking. And they tell. It's, it's, it's especially if you're like a, a rapper or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, so my whole point is the streets to me, I'm confused about the streets. I would like to know what's going on. Well, let's just call it for what it is, right? I'm not a street guy either. I don't care about having snitches around me because I don't break the law. There's nothing to snitch on. Yeah. I pay my taxes. You know, I don't carry legal guns. Uh, I don't sell drugs. I don't shoot people. I don't kill people. <laughs> right. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I have a legal business. And, you know, whatever happens to me, I'm not worried about any sort of actual snitching. Now, if you look at just the basic premise behind the no snitching code is so people don't get caught doing illegal activities. You know, I mean, like, for example, I just had academics on my show recently who did, did a, a big little Dirk interview, and Dirk hates rats. But the reason why he hates rats is because his dad and I think his uncle went to prison for a very long time because of people snitching on them, mm -hmm. right? And then he was ultimately raised by his mother. He didn't have a, a male figure around, and he feels like his life was negatively affected by not having that in his life, and he blames that all on the rats. Now- in my interview, I said, well, let's just take a step back from that. I can, I could understand that and that makes sense to me. But then again, your father and uncle, they went to prison not just because of the rats, was because of something they probably did illegally, right? The rat, in a way. In a way, or is that what it is? In a way. In okay. a way. So because because like because it's like what you're saying is true. Mm-hmm. But there was an understanding that what happened to them wouldn't happen to them. So the what whenever we're an talking understanding based on illegal activities uh, that uh, uh, multiple people are involved in, right? An understanding based upon like like a code, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there's a there's a there's a there's a code that it's like if you're in a relationship with somebody, there's an understanding that you won't go outside of the relationship. Now, they can do something to make you want to do that, but the understand, and you can say, hey, it was actually your fault that this happened, but the understanding is that, like, we won't, this, it won't get to this point. So you're right. What they did is essentially the reason why they went to jail, but that's a non-starter to them because they feel like there was an understanding that these were secrets that were going to be kept. Because at that point, everything that everybody's doing is illegal, so that doesn't have anything to do with it. What it really has to do with is who are gonna keep your secrets and how the infrastructure of that sort of thing moves. And by the way, I'd say this. If you are in the military mm -hmm. and something happens in your unit and you tell the rest of the guys in the military are not gonna fuck with you. If you're a police officer, and you go run to internal affairs about something. Now, it shouldn't be this way. Should like if nobody's gonna nobody likes somebody that tells. That shines a light on something that they did wrong themselves. You see what I'm saying? At right. some point, <laughs> right. everyone needs to grow up. I agree. At some point, I, everyone <laughs> needs to start acting like adults <laughs> and say, you know something? I didn't go to jail because of a snitch. I went to a jail. I, I went to jail because of all these done. robberies that I did, of all you know, of these kilos that I sold, and so forth. Well, hold on, hold on, At some point, and and but you went to jail on, because of on, the snitch. Though. And hold on, and let's let me take it one step further because let's let's look at Freeway Ricky, one of my you know yeah. one of my regulars on my show who sold drugs more than pretty much anyone sold more drugs than anyone I've ever interviewed, right? That I know of. When he he got snitched on by his plug. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. The guy who he made millions of dollars with. Right. Millions and millions and millions of dollars who ultimately cooperated and put him in prison. When he got to prison, the first thing that he felt was anger and betrayal. But after a couple of years, he realized, you know something? Snitching is just part of drug dealing. It is. It's just part of crime. Yeah. Tell if me. you do a crime, you will get snitched on. It's not the exception. It's not the unicorn. It's the actual rule. More often than not, you will be told on. Well, because it plays into a very base instinct of human beings, and that is self-preservation. Self-preservation, but usually this these rules of self-preservation are usually established by the higher-ups. No, no. So this one, see what I'm saying? So they won't go to prison, but a lot of times, like the, no, so the, the guys on the street are all is, going to jail and I'm they're not is, snitching, so the guy on top can keep functioning. It's self-preservation because it's self-preservation because people, if faced with five, 10, 25 years, obviously don't want to do that time, right? right. So they're gonna tell. This is the thing, and this is the part of it that's been romanticized. If you follow the history of La Cosa Nostra, the reason why they were able to avoid prosecution in a lot of ways before was because of Omerita, right? They did not tell. They right. did not tell any of that stuff. The government then changed the game on them. Rico. And came with the Rico. Right. And so when the government came with the Rico and it was, and then the penalties were different and like why you could be arrested and charged and yeah. stuff was different. Yeah, you didn't have to actually do the crime. You're just affiliated, affiliated with, with the it. people who are doing the crime. Right. That separates in that situation the diehards from the people who are really in, in it for the lifestyle and to yeah. be made guys. Yeah. They're not going to jail for, for, for 25 years for you. Yeah. And so they were able to kind of break La Cosa Nostra apart. I would even say that in like in places where I'm from, it's even a little, a little different from that. Law enforcement preys on the community mm-hmm. where I'm from. Law enforcement, we're over-policed. There's a distrust for law enforcement that is reflective of um, our relationship with them. And so whenever you involve law enforcement in a situation like that, it's like you're calling a white man to come deal with something that the community felt like they could kind of figure out. Now, this is what I'll say. You come, in, you come into my house, I'm going to shoot at you, and then after the shots are fired, I'm calling the police. Right. Okay. So, like, my thing was never, my father would never, ever, my father has never broken the law, God bless his soul, never broken the law, was the uh, old God fearing Catholic man would never call the police about anything. Yeah. Dude came to the house one time. I don't know if I told you this story. Dude came to the house, middle of the night. Bamming on the door. Boom, 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 boom. I wake up off the couch. My dad is like, uh, he's like, hey, yo, no, it's some niggas behind me, man. They, they, they trying to get me. They trying to get me, man. Call the police. My dad was like, nah, man. <laughs> nah, I was like, nah, man. Walk around. Uh, we lived. Uh, General Jackson. He's like, right there on Gardeer, there was a Circle K. He go walk around the corner, pay phone. It's well lit. Call the cops from the Circle K and they'll come help you out. And he was like, he was like, uh, I ain't going on a circle. Okay, I just told you it was behind me. My father went, look. And then he and then he, he walked away and he came back with his shotgun. Get off of my porch. I'm not calling the law out here. That's what he was saying. Call the law. Yeah. He's like, I'm not calling the law out here. Get off my porch. If I call the law on whoever chasing you, now my family is in danger. And I'm not, I'm not even having the police come to my house. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, that, that reminds me of Tony Yeo. I remember a couple of interviews ago, he said that he was at his house and his dad had a heart attack and he couldn't bring himself to call 911 because he was so anti-police. See? Luckily, there was someone else in the house that said, give I'm me calling, that phone. I'm calling. Yeah, and then they, they grabbed the phone away from him and, and they called. But it was like this aversion because he's never called 911 before. Now, clearly, this is a, a, situation, a, where a situation, you situation, need, situation where you need to you call 911. But it was like he just froze up. Because he's just so trained not to call the police. Yeah. 911, like I don't, you know, as us coming up in the hood, we was allergic to them three numbers. Yeah. My father lives with me. You know, he had heart attacks and I, I really didn't really want to even dial 911. It's done, you know, somebody in the house did it. 
but I'm just. Luckily, his dad made it through. You know, he he passed away. Rest in peace. But I'm saying, like, yeah, some people are just programmed. Their programmed hardwired. never to call the police. But but here's the thing. Also, this whole no snitching code, and we're gonna stand tall. And we're not gonna cooperate, <laughs> and so forth. So much of that really is such a non-important piece of the puzzle these days because these days you've got cameras everywhere. Yeah, it's going, you you've got away. cell phones everywhere. You away. could triangulate your position. Uh, social media is the absolute best detectives. Sherlock they Holmes ain't got so shit. Quick, bro. Oh my God, let me tell you. like I've seen so many cases of law enforcement using whatever's trending on social media into their cases. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I've seen this and stuff that we've reported on. So it's like, you got the entire internet working against you, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're a public figure, you're going to have enemies. I don't care if you're Drake. I don't care yeah. if you're Jay-Z. There's people who hate you that will go out of their way to call law enforcement with whatever piece of information they dug up. Mm -hmm. uh, you got everyone around you is on Instagram Live. You know what I'm saying? Like, look at John Morant. You know what I'm saying? Both times, one of which was self-inflicted when he was filming himself. Right. But there's Instagram Live. Everyone's on live. You know, everywhere you go, there, there's some sort of camera that you don't even know about. Mm -hmm. You know, there's cameras that they don't tell you about that they can't technically even use as evidence, but they know the whole story. You know, I remember the whole thing with like Lil C's, how everyone was calling him a snitch because he had to essentially say that Lil Kim knew the people who were involved in the Hot 97 shooting, which he, she said that she never knew, but it was like everything was already recorded. They had all the phone calls tapped and everything else like that. It was like, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to go to jail because you decide to lie? Like, So when we were doing Hip Hop Homicides, mm -hmm. I was, it was breathtaking the amount of information that your cell phone gives to law enforcement. Yeah. I, I watched law enforcement track a suspect from point A to point B to the murder scene, mm -hmm. triangling their cell phone. Yep. It's, I'm just telling you right now, man, you're not going to get away. Yeah. Okay? So it, we're, in a, we're in a situation right now to where if they want you, if they want you, now a lot of times, Things happen in the community and they don't care. It's part of the ecosystem. They let it work, it work itself out. But the higher profile the case, like they're not, you're not going to get away. So the snitching becomes a part of it. And then also now, shout out to Bruce Rivers, criminal lawyer, one of my favorite YouTube channels. The self snitching is breathtaking. It's like it, it I, it's just everything's changed. And I'm, I'm, I'm older now, so I don't care because I'm, I, I don't, you know, I don't be around, right? But it's just the things that used to not get talked about, the you would ask somebody, you'd ask somebody um, like why they went to jail. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even tell you. Now they've gone to jail and served their time and they've come home. Like why you went to jail? Nah, he don't want to know that. <laughs> nah, man, y'all play, play the Madden. You don't want to talk about that. <laughs> nah, that's not, you don't want to know that part of your uncle, okay? Play the Madden. You know what's up? So you're not gonna tell me why you went to now. Nah, I'm telling you now. Nah, I don't want to talk about that. You ain't talk about that. Now they tell you everything that they did before they go to jail. Yeah. They want you to know. Yeah, I, I'll be down. You know, I'll be busting my gun, bro. You know what I'm saying? I'll, I'll do it. I'll bust my gun at you right now. Like I'm, I'm calling the police. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like it just everything is different, and I, I don't understand it. But I'm also not a part of it anymore. Like I have a big burner doodle, or like I have. A Bernie's Mountain Dog half doodle. I walk him around my neighborhood. I feel safe. So, it, it, I, but I, as far as what I see, I don't get it anymore. My man Tax Stone, who just got thirty five years. Yeah. Because I had been talking to his lawyer as well. Yeah. And his lawyer thought that the worst case scenario was twenty five. He has already served six, so it's nineteen. You know, state time cut in half. I mean, at least you know it's. I mean, it's not great, but at least it's doable. Yeah. But they gave him 35 by running his charges consecutively instead of concurrent. Yeah. But I remember talking to his lawyer about the whole situation, about this case, and you know, they felt that they had a reasonable chance of beating it. 
because it was essentially self-defense. Yeah. Right? Right. Attack Stone was there. Troy Ave and Banger came in as the aggressors. Yeah. They attacked him. Tax was defending himself. Tax was defending himself. Right. Right? But ultimately, and, you know, the lawyer, I guess, talked to one of the jurors afterwards and to see sort of, you know, why they they voted the way they did. And they're like, well, you know, the, the Troy Ave testimony on the stand was whatever. You know, clearly the guy, you know, was taking the stand to you know, to try to put Tax Stone in prison and so forth. Yeah, but, his own. Um, yeah, but basically Tax had a, a jail phone and some of the stuff on his jail phone was used in the courtroom and it ended up hurting him more than anything else. You know, he got a little too comfortable with that phone in jail. And, you know, I, I had communicated with him on that jail phone, but I would, I would never ask him anything about, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, we're on a jail phone. I, I don't know who the hell's listening into this, yeah. but apparently... In these jails and in these prisons, they have something called stingrays, which they basically could analyze all the packets going in and out, and they could they could find text messages, they could find, mm -hmm. you know, actual tap phone calls and everything else like that. So people end up hurting themselves worse than any snitch could ever do to them. You know what I'm saying? Because snitches have, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times it's not like these snitches. Are, are law abiding citizens that just want to, you know, do good by the community. They usually have drug dealing charges themselves, robbery charges, murder charges, yeah. and, and they have a reason to try to cooperate, try to get their own charges. I mean, in, in Texas case, there was a guy that was what I believe was a convicted or, or a charged drug dealer who got on the stand that said, Oh yeah, uh Taxstone told me about uh killing the guy, you know, in a conversation. Like, oh really? Yeah. Like I, like, okay. Yeah. Like that, that's some bullshit, so, obviously. Another thing I learned while doing the show is just how crafty uh, the state and government are after you've already been arrested. Like some of these guys, they got them talking by using uh, undercover agents that they put in holding cells with them. Yeah, that happened to uh, Suge Knight actually. Right, so yeah. they, they take an undercover agent, put you, put them in a holding cell with mm -hmm. you, and then get you to talk like you're talking with another criminal. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you've just confessed to a crime yeah. to an undercover police officer. Yeah, who's recording the whole thing. Who's recording the entire yeah. thing. So all that kind of stuff happens. The tax situation breaks my heart. And it breaks my heart because I do believe that tax was defending himself. Yeah. But I also understand that that entire situation should have never happened. With the trajectory that Tax Stone was on, with how talented Tax is, mm -hmm. with Tax Tax's energy, um, his ear for music, uh, his ability to communicate, the sky was the limit mm -hmm. for Tax. Yeah, he'd be bigger than Gilly Wallow right now. He'd be gigantic. Yeah, and I hope against hope that um, that there is a way, either by appeal or some other method that all of that tremendous promise gets to come back to us sooner rather than later. Cause tax is just uh, a really authentic, super talented guy. Yeah. But I would also say this, if there's a lesson to be learned from the entire situation, the lesson to me is that when you start to move on a specific trajectory in your career, you also need to move on a different trajectory in your life. It just simply, wasn't worth it for tax to be going through what he was going through with Troy Ave. It did nothing for him at that particular point. Well, I mean, look. And so and so look, and I understand that tax is a man. Mm -hmm. He is a uh, he's a man that lives by who he is and what he is. Mm -hmm. But he just means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. And, and, and so and so to me, I absolutely believe that he was defending himself. Mm -hmm. But what I wish. What I wish is that, I mean, I guess you can't say that because if you're in a situation where it's you or them and they're coming at you, then you got to get busy. But I just kind of wish that that tax would have been a little bit more Hollywood with it. He's so real and so authentic that it ended up getting into a situation to where um, he like he had to get busy. It's just not fair, bro. Like it, like like I of. Of all the things that have happened, first of all, somebody died, somebody got shot in that situation. Yeah. And, you know, it's really over nothing. And just I 
if people go back and listen to Tax Season, that is a really unique, incredibly, incredibly insightful voice. Just a, 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 a yeah. rare authenticity. And now, you know, it's gone over some bullshit where I really believe that he was acting in self-defense. I, I really do. Yeah, I mean, listen, I did uh, Tax's last interview before he got locked up. It yeah. never fully came out because I was worried that there was something in there that could possibly be used against his case. I was going to contact him and see whether he's okay with me putting it out at this point. If he says no, then whatever, it'll just be buried. Mm. But yeah, the situation with Tax, look, as a voice in a field doing media, you're going to ultimately rub people the wrong way and there's going to be conflict based on your opinions, right? I'm beefing with a, whatever, a half dozen people right now or they're beefing with me over things that I've said about them and my opinions. It is what it is. Some people I respond to, some people I don't. You know what I mean? Some people we work it out, like an NLE chopper. Some people I don't yeah. work it out with. You know what I mean? It is what it is. But ultimately, when you start bringing guns into the situation, it rarely works out in your favor. Well, that's the part of it that I'm talking about. Yeah. The part of it that I'm it's, talking it's about the, it's is- It's the gun part. You know what I mean? And, and the, the whole thing of it is, is that like, taxes, where, where I think tax made his biggest mistake was bringing a gun into, you know, well, I mean, Irving that, Plaza. And so, and so that's what I'm talking about. What I mean, what I mean by that is- that, That's the part that really kind of disappointed me because it's like, tax was- well known enough and and respected enough that he could have just had a few people with him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like he could have had bodyguards with him that that would have physically protected him from Banger and from Troy Ave and whatever else. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, listen, I have security with me and we're armed most of the time, but sometimes we go into places where we can't bring our guns. You know what I mean? It is what it is. Well, not my guns, but their guns. You know what I mean? Because I'm hiring them to protect me, yeah. right? And, and the thing is also is that like, and this is such a hip hop thing and it, it annoys me so much that because a lot of these rappers and a lot of these, you know, kind of street oriented media personalities are so anti-police that they won't use actual police security. When you have an advantage when you have police security, right? I mean, look at, for example, the takeoff situation. An argument starts to ensue over a dice game, people are, oh, blah, blah, oh, let me get out of here before I hurt someone, Quavo said, and, oh, people are mad about money lost and so forth. Quavo's security pulled out his pistol, right? Mm -hmm. Which ultimately, I think, just escalated the situation from my point of view. Now, take that security guy out, like the homie security, some guy they grew up with who's legally licensed to carry, and put in an actual, you know, Atlanta police officer in that situation. That officer would have seen the things escalated and would have just pulled out his badge and said, everyone calm down. The police are here. You think a shooting would have happened with a cop right there in the middle as opposed to some guy with a pistol out? Think about that. Like, like when I, yeah. and, and I will say this clearly, like when I'm in LA, I use either ex-LAPD or current LAPD security. In New York now, I just use N active NYPD security. You know what I'm saying? Because my whole thing is like, I'm going to have an advantage over you if there's a problem. NYPD is the biggest police force in America. Right. You think someone go, if you want to go head up against an NYPD guy, be my fucking guest. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They have missile launchers. Like, you know what I mean? And tanks. Okay. Be my guest. Let's, let's, let's deconstruct. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning. Number one, these guys have a need to take care of themselves. And that need comes from what it's like to survive. I'm going to speak not for any of these brothers in particular, but I'm gonna just tell you from what I'm aware, from what I'm aware of. In order to survive uh, and thrive in some of the areas that they might have grown up in, mm -hmm. the the ethos is you have to be able to take care of yourself, and your brothers around you will take care of you as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a need to be independent, right? These are these are people that don't want to take money. Everybody talks about like. Uh, you know, getting welfare or assistance or anything like that. When I when, when I was coming up, the last thing that any any man wanted to do was to get food stamps. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be one of the guys out there. Not saying that we didn't. Not saying that people didn't. But you wanted to be one of the guys out there that could get it on your own. Mm 
mm-hmm. that could like all of that stuff shows independence. It shows that you're secure. It, it, it presents security, right? So you want to be able to not have to call anyone to keep you safe. That's the first thing. And I'm not saying that that's right. I'm saying that that a part of it is whatever happens to me, I don't care if it's me by myself and it's three of y'all. If it's three of y'all, I got to get down with three of y'all. But I know that my guys are going to come. But if it's just me, I'm not running. I don't need no passes from nobody. I don't need nobody to give me a second chance. If it's got to go down, I'm going to take my ass whoop and come back the next day and you're going to see what's up. That's the first thing. Secondly, the relationship between guys like what you're talking about and the police is not nearly secure enough where they would put, uh, where they would uh, trust the police to protect them. They would protect, they would trust the guys from their neighborhood who aren't the best shots, who are probably trigger happy. Yeah, hold the gun sideways. Who are, who, are, who are, but they know that those guys love them. If you're around the police, you got to worry about if you're smoking weed, if you got, if one of your homies, we, hold we, on, wait, wait. Weed is legal now. I, I get it, but but just okay. whatever, whatever drugs, there's a lot of these drugs ain't legal. You got to worry about what the homies around you are doing. There might be guys in your crew that got warrants, right? There might be all kinds of situations where you, we just don't want the police around. We don't want the cops around. So for you, yeah. that makes a lot more sense, I would say, than some of the other guys that we might be talking about. And, and I, and I, I could, you know, I could relate to that and I could feel, I could empathize in this particular situation. And if this is a rapper who's still on the block, who's ba- barely making enough off some show money and, and you know what I'm saying? Still, still trying to get a, you know, a major label deal and is barely scraping by and still, you know, lives with his mom in the hood and, and, you know, is just, just has, you know, just, but it's the fun- habits die it's, hard though. Bro. It's fronting for the gram, you know, it's using his man's jewelry. And, and I get it. There's just not enough money to go around. You're still living where you live. You're still accessible and so forth. I'm talking about the guys who live in Calabasas, who live in Hidden Hills, who, who live in gated communities, who are multimillionaires, you know, who they have. They still think they're the person that we're talking about. And exactly. so, and so and that's what I'm the, t- This is yeah. immaturity. This is immaturity. You see what I'm saying? At the end of the day, listen. I hire police security, right? Do they ever try to bust me or people around me? You know what I mean? Like they I'm, wouldn't try to bust you though. But I I've, I've been around you're, but you but they never but Vlad, you have to even the, pol- the even guy the police that you, listen, listen, don't the, look at you the same way they look at me. Listen, the the, the the police officer that you're on that's you're paying to put on payroll is not going to go out of his way to then bust you or someone around you. I'm not you. saying that you he see will. what I'm saying? But I'm saying yes, <laughs> you may not be able to sniff coke around this cop. Oh, well. Or oh, or well. somebody or else pills. around, but you never know what's going to happen, well, you right? don't. And, and certain people just need to be left behind you because you're now a multimillionaire <laughs> who lives it. in a gated community, who right. has millions of dollars, let me ask you a question. who's taking care of a lot of people. Let me ask you you a can't roll like that anymore. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you been handcuffed in your life? Mm, four? You've been handcuffed four? One. To around four times. Around four times. Yeah. I'm not talking about freaky deaky. I'm talking about by the cops. By the cops. Okay. Yeah. Um. No, what what were you times. handcuffed for? Do you remember? Um. Once as a kid, we were uh, we were at school fucking around, letting off a bunch of fireworks and shit like that. Police right. came, arrested everyone. Had no, 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 yeah, yeah, arrested everyone and so forth. Another time as a kid. Me and a group of my friends broke into the mall and stole a bunch of candy and shit. Right, and right. then when we came out, we had lost the key to the bikes that we had locked together. The police showed up, found all of our stolen goods. Right. We were all arrested. You know, I had to do a bunch of community service. And the last two times uh, when I was living in New York, I was pulled over with suspended licenses. Uh, I went to jail for like three days the first time. And then the second time, um, you know, I got handcuffed and they basically just, I paid my bond and they let me go. So four four different times. Okay. okay. I, uh, the, the last time, the third time, no, five five, five times altogether. The the, the fourth damn, time I got locked up. I'm a master up. criminal. I'm not a master criminal. But the, <laughs> the fourth time I actually got roughed up by the police. They slammed me against the, you know, the hood and, you know, like were extra rough with me for no reason. You know what I'm saying? And mm. so forth. I've never gotten beaten up or, or you know, right. beaten bloody by the police, but I've been roughed up and I've been, you know, had shit talk you know talk to me and stuff like that okay yeah so i've been handcuffed i think six times okay i have never broken the law Mm. when i say never broken the law i mean i have never been handcuffed as a result of breaking the law 
Okay. First time I was ever handcuffed, I was standing in my driveway. I was sitting in my driveway doing my homework. The second time I was handcuffed, I was riding in the car with some guys that had committed a crime before. In that same car, went and did whatever they did, dropped their shit off, came back and picked me up and go to a party. I don't know what's going on, and I get handcuffed. Third time was at a club. The cop came around with a taser, was tasing everybody. I'm like, oh, shit, taser. And he goes, what? 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 Come here. Say it to my face. I'm like, oh, I'm saying you got a taser. And he was, because he was tasing people to get him off the sidewalk. And I'm like, oh, I'm just saying you got a taser. I got to tell you, yeah, what about it? What about it? Turn around. Handcuff me. Mm -hmm. Ran my shit. And the fourth time I was handcuffed, I was just walking in the specific part of Baton Rouge. And just like the first time, I fit the description. So think about what we just did. I, ha I have a completely clean record. You are actually a criminal. You've broken the law several times. I did not know this about you. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. like, but, but what I'm saying is my relationship with the police is totally different than your relationship with the police. I, I said earlier that I will call the police in a pinch, right? Other than that, I don't want them around me. It's, I, it's danger. I see the cops and I'm like, oh shit, like, I used to be like, you know, I see the cops, I turn my fucking music down. I don't want them to get, I don't want any fucking reason for the police to notice me. Right. I don't feel safer around the cops and I don't want them coming to parties with okay. me. <laughs> and, and let me just tell you for everyone who right. just doesn't know who hasn't experienced it. I don't like having police around me either, <laughs> unless I'm paying them. Right. When I pay the police, Nah, it's man. a completely different situation. Still don't trust me. You know what I'm saying? The cop that I use in New York was a fan of my mixtapes back in the day. You know what I'm saying? We have a friendly relationship. Right. And he's there to protect me and he's got his gun. And let me tell you what happens when shit goes down. If shit really goes down and someone got, gets shot or someone gets killed, your homie who does security, who may have a warrant out, who, who's anti-snitching, will say, I didn't see nothing. Right. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. But the cop's going to tell the truth. The cop is going to get on the stand mm -hmm. and explain that this is what led up to the situation and this is why he was forced to pull out his pistol and kill the person who was a threat. And I will be able to actually walk away as opposed to being charged for a murder See, because my friend just shot somebody and he doesn't want to talk. I don't want the police. When I get to the point that I get to the, uh, the personal security joint, I want like some Jason Bourne motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? I want, you know what I'm saying? Take a fucking pencil, mm, stab, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like that. You know, they do that move where they do like that. <laughs> they, they grab your you shit. You want a green beret or yeah, a Yeah, like you know what I'm saying? They right. grab your shit and it's like, this is Mr. Latham right here. You know, like, grab your shit and they do like that. That's what that's that's the kind of people that I want. But I I, I do understand why people don't want the cops. But to round this off, um, I do think Tass will be home before. The, the 35 years, I think there's a a lot of opportunity on appeal for him. Mm -hmm. Um and I miss his voice, man. Like I I miss his yeah, voice out here. Like, it, there's a there's a lot of subjects that he that he's tailor made to talk about. So free tax stone, man. Well, in other news, Kang the Conqueror, Jonathan Majors, yeah. is uh well, he went to court recently he did. with Megan Good in tow. The heartbreaking thing about this, as a fan of Jonathan Majors, you could honestly say this is the hottest, like, new actor in Hollywood. You know, I mean, not to say that he's new, new, but in terms of, like, a trajectory of actors in Hollywood, I can't think of a person who's on this same rise that Jonathan Majors is. He's a major Marvel figure. He's starring in major films. You know, I mean, he's got, he's got a lot of acting ability to do different types of roles. He's not just typecast as one type of person. And to have it all potentially come crashing down over an argument with his girlfriend, mm -hmm. ooh, it's he disappointing was, uh, and it hurts. He, he was not just the hottest actor in Hollywood at this point. To me, he was the hottest new black actor I had ever seen. I had never seen hmm. anybody. So, and this is what I mean. So we've obviously seen, so let's think about some guys. Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan. Okay, so let's think about that, right? So Michael B. Jordan comes out of either Chronicle or Fruitvale Station. Fruitvale Station. And so out of Fruitvale Station, boom. 
Yeah. But what I'm talking about with Jonathan is Jonathan came from having Creed and then Ant-Man and then having signed on for nine Marvel films. Like he was, he had a movie that was, that came out and went number one. And then Creed went number one. He had Devotion last year, right? Mm -hmm. It, everything was, there was this point to where he was just the guy. And not just about films that he was in. Every single person wanted him to be in that movie. The, the discussion around Jonathan in the town was about, you know, I, there's one film to where people were like, um, the role was for somebody that was supposed to be like 54, 55 years old. You know, it's like, and it was like, yo, but you know, he's only 33, but I wonder if we can make him older so he could come in. You know what I'm saying? Like he was, yeah. because that package um, of that prodigious talent uh, and his, like aesthetically how people felt yeah, about really it. really well built, built good the whole looking, nine. the whole nine. Yeah. It, was, it was all of this stuff was coming at the same time. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's happened over the last X amount of months has been shocking and has really put a dent in a lot of people, not just Jonathan. This has had ripples throughout the entire town of, you know, companies like Disney that had their entire fortunes. Yeah, I mean- that's sort of what everyone's holding their breath for right now is whether Disney's going to drop him from Kang the Conqueror. Yeah. If he gets dropped from Kang the Conqueror, I think that that's going to be a, a major, major blow to him. Right. You know what I'm saying? Now, if they keep him, he could potentially come back and, you know, this will just be a blip on the radar, which we're all hoping for. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, Denzel didn't have this kind of trajectory. You know, just did, coming Denzel out. did such great work for such a long time. You know, it's interesting, yeah. man. So with the 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 Jonathan situation because we're at a point in society in terms of the way we discuss things that uh we are worrying about them more than we're litigating them. So I'll tell you what this means, what I mean by that, is that the way things should happen is in society is that someone is accused of something and we look at the accusations, the way they come out, and we decide whether or not these accusations are credible and real and whether or not they really happened. And then based upon that, you move forward um, with either your innocence or your guilt affirmed to people. Mm -hmm. But we haven't had a society that is equitable enough for that to be a thing for people. So when the women that look at the situation that Jonathan is in right now, when they look at it and they're triggered by it, they're triggered from decades and decades and decades, years, hundreds of years in many cases, of claiming that things have happened to them, saying that things have happened to them, and, and having society default to the more important, um, the more powerful man mm -hmm. of saying, hey, my boss is grabbing my ass. Hey, my boss did this of, hey, I was beat up by this guy. I was raped by this guy of having women in domestic violence situations where they can't escape them uh, because they're either financially or emotionally tethered to their husband in a way that doesn't allow them to really tell their full truth. And they have to either endure it or pretend like it didn't uh, move on, pretend like it didn't happen. Um, because of that. So now, knowing all of that and wanting to be on the right side of people claiming, women claiming that they've been abused, mm -hmm. people claiming racism, people claiming sexism, homophobia, we can't just be like, okay, this is what's going on with Jonathan Majors. Let's see how this really went down. Before it even gets to that, what we have to do now is make sure that people know that we're either on one side or the other side of society. The one side of society being like, man, these bitches be lying. And the other side of society being like, every single accusation made is real, mm -hmm. right? The reality of it is, is this. And people can feel however they want to feel about me after saying this. The overwhelming majority of times that a woman says that she was raped or assaulted, it's true. The overwhelming majority of times that that gets reported to authorities, it's accurate. You guys don't have to take you guys don't have to take my word for that. Okay, there are studies that have been done independently 
to weed out and understand the fraudulent and unfounded claims. However, however, what just happened to Travis Rudolph, that is fucking real. I mean, that's real. So the question is, what happened to Travis Rudolph or what happened to, to, to or what's going on with Jonathan Majors or what's going on the countless amount of times, the un overwhelming amount of times that women say these things and they're telling the truth, it, it shouldn't be um, a measure of how good of a person you are. These are things that happen in society that we have to look at through both their incidents and their power. And the reality is, this is probably too much for Disney. This all of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. This is probably too much for Disney to probably go. Probably too much for Disney. But yeah. it doesn't mean that that happened the way that we think it happened on either side. We just don't know. Yeah, and I wouldn't disagree with you. I think that that women have ultimately remained silent through abuse and rape and so forth throughout history. And saying that most times that they say it happened, it probably did happen. I just feel that at a certain, when you're talking about a certain financial level of the accused, I think that those numbers do start to shift as the money amounts start to go up and there's a potentially a civil lawsuit that goes along with these, with these accusations. I disagree. And the reason why I would say that is because it's more difficult to make a credible claim against a powerful man. Because if you... If you make a if you make a credible claim against a powerful man, then what you have to deal with is the infrastructure that that man has around him assailing you. Right. The more somebody is invested into any potential abuser for anything, the more difficult it is for the person making the claim against them. This is probably true. In the criminal sense, but when it comes to the civil sense. It's actually way easier to get a bunch of money out of a rich person than it is over a working person because that person doesn't have a lot of money and the rich person will usually just settle to make the situation go away whether there's guilt there or not. And everyone knows it. The lawyers know it. The legal system knows it. Very few of these cases actually go to court and get decided by a jury because as someone who's been through multiple civil cases on both sides, I see how this works. You're sitting there, you've spent 75000 and you're saying, that your lawyer tells you it's going to cost another three hundred to go to court and win, and you can't get any of these, any of this legal money back. So you might as well just settle for the person for like, you know, 10, 20K, make them go away, and you're done. And you, you're paying, you just paid close to $100,000 for nothing, but you can't risk, you don't... Financially, it doesn't make sense to go to court and everyone knows it and they have a lawyer on, conting on contingency. So therefore, the accuser is not paying any money out of their own pocket. Right. Right. So, so, what, I'm, so what I'm telling you is this, though. There's a far cry between because if, if I come out or if, if a woman comes out and says so-and-so raped or abused me. Yeah. And then you settle. Yes. If you settle that lawsuit to a lot of people, that's an admission of guilt. Right. I, so just listen to me real quick. It's, it's a different. It's a, we used to call it at, at TMZ um, the two hundred fifty thousand dollar threshold. Con, uh, uh, Kanye actually even said that one time. Not everybody at TMZ, but a couple of us. Like you come out a paparazzi, you you, you punch a paparazzi. Boom. That's two fifty. That's two fifty. Okay. Boom. That's two fifty. Paparazzi got you. Yeah. He made you mad. He got you. That's two fifty. You might as well pay the two fifty because you're gonna pay it anyway. And then on the other side of that, it's gonna be a big deal. If woman A says guy B raped her and then there is a settlement, that right there has to be contended with with the people that are now working with guy B, with guy A. So if the settlement, if it can be kept quiet, like we've seen in places like Fox News and other places like that where people have had allegations and they've they've dealt with them in-house, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if a woman is gets to a point and says, this guy did this and then you pay her money, a lot of people, that guy is still going to be toxic. What that person really wants and what they really want is, especially if they're in a situation to where public perception of them matters in the way that they do that your job. Meaning, if you're an NBA player, public perception of you matters, but at the same time, you work for a league and if you can score 50 points a game, you can score 50 points a game. But if you are an actor or a musician, people are coming to you because they like you. 
particularly if you are an actor, that is a PR personality type of situation. So too many settlements. I mean, we're talking about Michael Jackson, right? Like people are talking about Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson has never been criminally like convicted of anything. Right. But the settlements that Michael Jackson has had to pay lend themselves to what people think are impropriety, uh, imp impropriety from Michael Jackson. And so now he is branded a child molester. So right. what I would say is in this situation, yeah. in this situation, coming out and making that type of accusation is still an incredibly arduous and, and dangerous thing for a woman to do against a very prominent man because her name's going to get drugged through the mud. Well, but if you're working a minimum wage job, you're not a public person. You're a Jane Doe in a lot of these cases as well, <laughs> right? Remember the whole uh, Nelly situation? Yeah. There was a Jane Doe that claimed that he raped her. Ultimately, it went nowhere. Mm. But you still don't know who this Jane Doe is, right? Right? He had to spend a whole bunch of money, and he got his, his you know, his reputation ran through through the mud and so forth. But let me tell you something: as someone who's been through court cases and has oh. had depositions and the whole thing, there is one thing to say. Okay, I have these accusations. I settle them. You know, I admit no wrongdoing in the process. Everything, you know, life goes on as opposed to going to the courtroom and now every detail is being pulled out. You're doing depositions, which become public. People release footage from the depositions. Every single, you know, they go and get access to your cell phone and your email and all this other personal shit is now being thrown into the air. Like, you're better off just settling and letting certain people think, oh, he just settled because he's guilty. When a lot of times, people who really know, people in a state of power who have money all know that settlements most times are not admission of guilt. It's just a financial decision. Well, I mean, that's that's true. But at the same time, I mean, a settlement is not an admission of guilt or innocence. Correct. It's a settlement, right? It's the it's easiest the easiest legal thing to do. Yes. This is why I'll say to that. Every, every single person that is rich, famous, or noteworthy for any reason is a target. Mm -hmm. Every single person. Including me and you. Including me and you. Yes. Um, every single person that's rich, famous, or noteworthy is a target. That's true. That's true. If you've known a victim of sexual abuse, uh, if you've talked to many different women across the, uh, the spectrum that have been victims of sexual abuse, um, and if you've looked into the cases and to the case studies of a lot of these things, I believe that women are still more likely, way more likely, to be sexually abused and physically abused by rich and powerful men and say nothing than they are to make assertions like that when it didn't happen. I agree. And so I, I guess the thing is, the, so the, the thing is now is knowing that we have to do better by our women and knowing that there is a history in America of black men being falsely accused of sexual assault, how do we square those two emotional things? Because when I say emotional things, I mean, it is emotional. There's data. There are numbers that have been crunched on how much of these things are lies. And it's been done in Canada, in America, all over the place. It just doesn't happen as much as people think it does. It doesn't happen a lot at all. So there's number. But the argument that we're having is an emotional argument, particularly in the black community where uh, powerful and successful black men are so meaningful to us that immediately, back in the day, when Mike Tyson had this situation, my mama was like, she lying. My mama was like, she lying. You know what I mean? Like I heard from so many, we just, we know that that's the way that you take them down. But now that we want women to be more powerful and empowered, how do we have conversations about this, about Jonathan Majors, even though his accuser is, looks to be white, but how, how do we have conversations about this and talk about this in a way that prioritizes the truth of it and not how we feel about it? Because the way we feel about this right now is, we have to wait and see what happens. That's it. Like, I mean, the, the way, excuse me, the, the, the truth of it is we have to wait and see what happens. The way we feel about it is either get this nigga out of here or whatever. And I'll just want to make sure that, that, that I acknowledge that 
you know, there are people that think that there are other women that will come forward or have come forward, whatever. Well, with Jonathan Majors, other women have come forward and are cooperating with NYPD. Okay, so once we I have... Know, I don't know the details So of that, once so. we have that... I'm just telling in, the, the facts. Of, of the once we that. have that information and once there's a trial and once it all comes out, everyone is free to make whatever uh, sort of um, uh, determination about Jonathan Majors they want. They're free to make it now. But what I would just say is a lot of this is, is girded up in how we feel about uh, either black men being put on trial or the protection of black women or protection of women, period. Well, if there is a trial, but usually there's no trials, you know, 90% of cases end up pleading, right? right? So so he might, he might plead out. He might plead out. But I'll tell you, you know? right now, I, I'm, I, I would like to think that we live in a country to where if you get accused of something and you beat it, then you're an innocent person. Uh, but, you know, there are caveats. And I, I don't know how things are going to work out for him particularly with a company like Disney, hmm. who yeah. who is a family-oriented co- a company. Yes. And, you know, and also, sometimes people beat stuff, you know. Yeah. OJ killed them two people. Well, this takes me to my next topic. And this is something that you've actually commented on yourself, the the YK Cyrus uh, Sukiana yeah. situation. Yeah. During an interview, uh, YK kind of approach Suki and I guess try to kiss her and so forth. And she was resisting. And, you know, I guess the co-host was kind of laughing at the situation and so forth. And when the video came out, it just looked really bad for YK, who I've interviewed before multiple times. Nice kid, very young, somewhat naive. You know, if you were to give me, you know, if I were to give my honest opinion on him, he's definitely, you know, he was thrown into this business as like a teenager essentially, and you know, has been trying to adjust and so forth. But it was kind of cringy when you saw what happened. It was bad. It was it was cringy. And from his point of view, I don't know what their relationship was beforehand. Mm-hmm. Right? Maybe the last 10 times they saw each other, Sukiana jumped on him and was kissing on him and they're playing around and so forth. And on that particular day, she wasn't feeling that type of playful energy. Yeah, but why would you I, I say know. maybe they've had that before? I don't know. See, that's the thing. Watching this, there was some air of familiarity yeah. between those two. Yeah. I'm not justifying what he did, but what I'm saying is this was not a total stranger rolling up on this girl and she's like, who the hell is this? Clearly, they know each other to some degree and he didn't read the room properly and he did what he did and it looked cringy, you know, and so forth. Yeah. Now he did apologize multiple times yeah. and she accepted his apology right. publicly. Yeah. But you've had something to say about this. Um, yeah, I think there's there's an underlying message here. Um, and that is men feel entitled to women. Hmm. They men feel entitled to women. If we're being honest, if we just if I'm just talking, men feel entitled to women. Our bodies tell us that uh a woman is there to sort of meet a need that we have. And we know this need. We've been knowing this need since we were eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. There's a need that our bodies have told us that we have and women are there to meet this need. Um, my dad, God rest his soul, who was my version of a man, he, he, it's my version of a man, my image of a man, should I say. So I remember I got to be 16, I was 15, my dad, my dad said, yo, you had any pussy yet? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I haven't had any pussy yet. Because it makes us just a lie to him. He he knew the answer to the question before he was asking me. He was like, all right, now. Nah. Right, you're 16, man. You're a Lathan man. You know, you're 16. You ain't had no pussy yet. You know, you're a Lathan. And so it's interesting that that made me think, shit. I got to get some pussy. Like, I have to have sex with a woman. So the women that I would meet were no longer individuals. They were beings to uh, reinforce my manhood. They were things for me to try to become a man with, like to be be a Lathan man. It's not like I didn't want to have sex with them. I, of course, wanted to have sex with them very badly. But now my manhood was being reinforced by the fact that a woman was there to have sex with me, right? And I think sometimes as men, we look at women like that. And the reason why I bring that up with the Sukihana situation is because she talks very openly about how much she loves sex, about how she's a sexual being, about the things that she does. I've seen the things that she's done. Right, she has videos of her giving head. And giving stuff head like and that. all that stuff like yeah. that. 
that in no way entitles any man to her body. Agreed. Like, not even in a little bit. Yeah. But what men sometimes are looking for is not permission from a woman or not consent for a woman. They're looking for a reason. They're looking for a reason, like a reason. Okay, so the reason is she's dressed a certain way, which must mean that she consents. The reason is she talks a certain way, which means that she she is okay with this. A reason to bypass treating the woman as a human being. A reason to go around having her to give, having her giving her the same respect that you would want her to give to you. And so in this, I saw another situation on Candy Burris's podcast where the guy who is her co-host um takes his phone and apparently showed Sugihana uh, a picture of his of his dick, right? Mm-hmm. Showed him a, a picture of his dick and was telling her how he wanted to do all of this kind of stuff and all of that. He felt like the way she talks about herself gave him a reason that he could do that. It doesn't. Yeah. If a woman says, I like to fuck big dicks, that don't mean she want to fuck yours. Right. You know what I'm saying? That don't mean that she wants that from you. Yeah. She could be saying all of that and be talking about one guy, her husband. Yeah. She could be talking about every guy except, except for you. For you. <laughs> you know what I mean? True. And so the reality of it is, and I'm not putting all of this on, um, YK Osiris because it's bigger than him, right? It's it's bigger than him in the way that we deal and relate to women. He learned the hard way that there is a way that you conduct yourself when you are around a woman. And he learned it in front of the entire world. And I hope that everybody else learned it with them. That doesn't mean that they're not, we know that there are ways that consent is not verbal, right? Everybody knows you, you, you kiss it on a girl, you, you got her down there. You put your hands on the panties. If she lifts her ass up so you can take her, 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 her underwear off, it's a go. Everybody knows if she, if she, it, 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 at least at that point, until she says it's not a go. Everybody knows that there are ways that nonverbal consent happens. Everybody knows that a, a lot of times men and women are in situations where they, everybody understands what's going on. But in that situation, there's no way you could argue that that's what was going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so for him and for everybody else, I'm not ready to, I'm not, I'm not with the canceling shit. I think the kid came back and took responsibility for it. I think that she opened up and talked a little bit about how she looks at things. And she showed to me, um, uh, a lot of compassion, Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the situation resolved itself in a way that was that was nutritious. You know what I mean? And it's important to for everybody else to accept her apology too, not just YK Osiris. But the reality is this. Men are in no way entitled to women's bodies. Like, they're just not. I agree. I agree. Then there's the whole Zion, Williamson, <laughs> Mariah Mills situation. <laughs> so yeah. Zion goes and does a, uh, a photo shoot with his uh, soon-to-be baby mother. Which I guess ruffled some feathers with some of the other girls that he was dealing with. One of which was a uh, former adult film star, Mariah Mills. Yeah. What's actually interesting, someone actually pointed this out on Twitter, was that um, Mariah, in all of her uh, porn scenes, has never done a scene with a black man. All her scenes were with white guys. That's, is that real? That's real. I actually researched it. <laughs> No way, like, like, come on, like, 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 like. Go ahead and look. For everyone who's watching this right now, do your Googles. Go on Pornhub. Go on whatever, whatever other you know site you choose to uh, participate on. All of her scenes with, with white guys are like white Spanish dudes. Wow. There's not a single black man in any of her Why scenes. Why is that so fucking funny? That's hilarious, man. I don't know. I just wanted to point out that little tidbit. Okay. You know, and then, of course, she's all in love with Zion Williamson, who's the exact opposite of everyone she does scenes with. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's nuts, bro. <laughs> um, go ahead and look it up. Go ahead. Go I'm home and look it up. up. I'm going to look. You're going to look it up right now? I'm going to look ahead. it up. I'm going to look ahead. it up. Okay. Go ahead. Because I, I, can't, I can't really see. Because I feel like, you know, I've been... 
And by the way, I just I don't know why you don't bring the porn stars back on here no more. How come the porn stars? They've had their time. I, I, I'm, letting, <laughs> I'm, letting, I'm letting Adam 22 <laughs> carry on the torch. He's much more suited to these types of interviews. You know what I mean? Than I am. I remember you was rocking with I was, Skin I was Diamond. Rocking. Oh, yeah. Was, uh, uh, Sarah J. You had yeah, a pop. And, and the men, too. Lexington Steele, Mr. Yeah. Marcus. Yeah, the whole the whole nine. But, you know, I've had my time. I've had, you know. It was like, like I'm out of the life. I've okay. gotten the views. Go ahead. Look it up. Let me see. Uh, Mariah Mills. It's M-O-R-I-A-H. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's actually the subject of some message board posts. <laughs> yes. Not a single scene. Hold on. I think, is there one here? I'm looking nope. at one. Um, Not a single one. No, this is not. Yes. Not a single black man. Not even a light-skinned black man. Because this is, this is, uh, this is, this one right here is labeled her, but it's not her. It's not her. Yeah. I'm going to gotta say that scene. Come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Bookmark that. <laughs> yeah, <I> gotta... <laughs> For our research purposes, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you know, and, and by the way, what, what's also kind of interesting is if uh, if you go on Queen's Flip's uh, YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, Zion's uh, soon-to-be baby mother, there's a video of her fighting another girl in the street and, like, bashing the girl's head against the wall. And it's that New Orleans a titty, shit. A titty fell out at one point. You know what I mean? I bookmarked that one, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can bookmark that one as well. Mm. So Z Zion's, uh, you know, taste in women, you might have to work on that a little bit. You know what I'm saying? But so now she flipped out on Twitter, exposed a bunch of DMs, claims that he was giving her like 100000 a month. Yeah. And uh, I think it culminated with her threatening to leak a sex tape unless he got like uh, traded and then Twitter shut her down because you can't do shit like that. Yeah. Luckily. Yeah, Twitter, Twitter was way late with the shutdown. Way late. <laughs> <laughs> way late with the shutdown. I, I was starting to feel harassed by Mariah Mills. I was, I, I was like, I was starting to feel harassed. I was like, yo, man, you gonna leave us alone? Uh, at, it went from, damn, Zion's in some real shit being reckless, right? Reckless, whatever. I don't know if he's reckless. I don't know if he's reckless. He's what, 23 years old? He got $200 million. He gonna fuck some porn stars. I mean, that's the way that it goes. Like, it, it's like, I, I don't know that he's even being reckless. I mean, right. Cause he's a single man. He's yeah, in his he's early single, 20s. Yeah. He's doing nothing wrong. At the end of the day, he was, you know, listen, man, he was a kid growing up watching porn. Yeah. He was broke all through his college days. Right. Suddenly he started his real career. He's got a ton of money. So yeah, he's going to live out some of his fantasies, fantasies and everything yeah, else. I, like don't that. Think that's, I personally don't see anything wrong with what he did at all. I don't either. And I also think that Mariah Mills is doing a little harm to sex workers because she's kind of making it seems, seem as if there's something untoward about what he was doing. Like, look how much money he was paying me. Look how much he was doing this. Look how much, like, there's something bad. There's a lot of women that that's how they get their bread. Mm -hmm. So it's like nothing wrong with it. He was paying. He, You guys were together. Yeah. It seems like it worked out for everyone. The thing that I'll say is that, like, um, um, this is a good lesson for Zion. It's a good lesson for Zion how to keep his paperwork together <laughs> in terms of those NDAs and about the fact that it might be time for Zion to pick some women that have something to lose. Uh, yeah. and, and, and the only reason why is because, like, there was a time when... Um, proximity to somebody famous or notable was currency, right? Athletes and entertainers have always been with sex workers and women in, the, in, in that industry. And women have always been with men who are sex workers. And they, it's always happened, right? But it used to be that either being invited to that person's house or being around that person or being next to that person was something that was valuable because mm -hmm. they would pay you, keep you coming to the place yeah. or whatever, whatever, right? That's not what's valuable anymore. What's valuable anymore is people knowing that you did it because the reality is as much money as the celebrity can give you for um, uh, like having sex with them or being around them or being at the party, the fame that you get from letting everybody know that that happened 
is probably worth more. Right now, Mariah Mills is more famous than, she, famous than she's ever been. Now, she's quit porn, right? She says she's quit porn. She, well, she sells OnlyFans and she stuff. She sells OnlyFans. But the reality is there's probably more curiosity about her. Mm -hmm. There might be a point where people are paying her to do more walkthroughs. It might not last as long or she might, might not have as, as much money as it would have been for being around Zion Williamson. But she now kind of doesn't need him anymore for people to pay attention to her because she will always be the person that talked about this, this yeah. person. Put him on blast. Put him on blast. And because of that, you got to be a little bit tighter with the way that you move or somebody that you would be around. And there are plenty of women, plenty of people working in that industry that wouldn't do that. But for him, even if it should or if it shouldn't, it's going to reflect on his uh, personality and his brand in a way that he probably doesn't want. So whereas it used to be that like you hear, hey man, ex-athlete threw this party and it was all of these porn stars here. And if you meet those girls, they'll tell you those stories. Mm -hmm. We were here, we were there. I knew a girl, um, I was working at TMZ. She had been seeing this one guy for like six years and consistently getting money from him. Never told. Because the thing was, she had her own career and the money was stable and Twitter wasn't as big of a deal when I had this conversation. Uh, we were doing a story on her. But now, you could blow up from that. That's your entree into being hyper-famous. Mm -hmm. That's all that really matters. Because even if Mariah Mills was emotionally upset with what happened to Zion, with, with, with Zion, which I'm not saying that she wasn't. She may have been. I don't know the nature of their relationship. Obviously, after a while, the attention that she was garnering from the tweets is what was making her continue to do it. Well, and I'll tell you this, as someone who has dated a lot of women over the years and so forth, there is a basic rule that I have always abided by that I recommend all men, young and old, abide by. And that is, is if you're dealing with a woman romantically on any level, never let that woman walk away mad. Always work it out with that person. Mm. Always be proactive with your communication. Don't, you know what I'm saying? Because obviously, if you're, even if you're paying a woman, if you see that woman repeatedly, there is going to be an emotional aspect of that relationship. For sure. Even if there's money, it's, even if it's transactional every single time, there's going to be an emotional connection because we're all humans. Right. Right. You're going to like that person. You're gonna. You're not just going to be having sex, with, you know, with them the whole time. You're going to be having conversations. So you feel like Zion fucked up by popping up with the baby and not letting her know. I I think if Zion, you know, because it seemed like they were seeing each other repeatedly. They were. This wasn't Seems like, like a one-time thing where he paid her whatever ten thousand. They fucked and they went about their way. I think in that case, no one would have really cared much, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that he was seeing her. There was. She had tweeted stuff about how he wanted to move out to like New yeah, Orleans yeah, and something, yeah. something, something. Yeah. So clearly there was some sort of relationship that was more than just sexual. Had he been proactive about treating her as a woman and not just a sexual object, that could have been prevented. Hey, listen, I know that we've been dealing with each other and I really like you, but you know something? I'm... This other girl that I've been dealing with as well is pregnant and she's going to have the baby and, you know, we're going to publicly announce that and so forth. But, you know, something that doesn't change our relationship, I still want to continue dealing with you. Yeah. You know, or if I don't want to keep dealing with you because of my situation here, let me go ahead and and work something out where... Or give her a baby bonus. Hit her off with 200000 here, yeah, Here's a baby bonus. Here's something. <laughs> here's right. whatever. And, you know, something... And most times... Not every time, because you have vindictive people and you have people who are cloud chasing and it doesn't matter what you say and so forth. You know, I mean, there's going to be people that are gonna, they're going to try to extort you and, and so forth. Like, this is just what comes with the territory if you're dealing with multiple women. But you can, if you treat a person kindly, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you humble yourself, if you take the blame for mistakes that you've made by hurting the person in some cer certain type of way, most times it'll work out okay. It won't work out in, in this Mariah fashion. Right. You know, where suddenly Stephen A. Smith is talking about you and, and her, and it's just a, a train Man, wreck. When Zion, when Zion came out <laughs> with the thing about how he helping the kids, did you see that? The, oh, yeah, yeah. You donated I, the I was like, like oh, man, <laughs> they got him on the run, baby. <laughs> God bless the young man. I hope he gets healthy and has a great career. Yeah, man. And that this is, he did I think nothing wrong. Yeah. He's not cheating on his wife. Yeah. You know, he didn't beat anyone up or, you know, he didn't like, 
kick someone in the stomach and cause an abortion or, you know, I right, mean, yeah, you know, yeah, put yeah. a hit out on the, you remember like that one, was it football player? Ray put, Carruth. Ray Carruth, right. Yeah. He put a hit out and, and had his <laughs> baby mother shot and the baby came out like mentally deformed and the fucked up. And, you know, I mean, like a really tragic type of thing. Listen, man, he out here in his early 20s slanging dick. You know, getting Doing to fuck he, everyone who he watched, you know, in right. porn movies, yeah. you know, IG models, porn models, you know, whatever else. He's single. He got a kid on the way. The fuck? It is. Yeah. It's, it's the like, fuck. Have, live your life, Zion. Live your life. Just be aware. <laughs> be aware. <laughs> <laughs> um, Larsa Pippen. It was just announced that she's oh getting half of Scottie Pippen's Bulls pension. Uh, and this is on top of the dating of the Marcus Jordan um, you know, the, the stories with future, Bruh. uh, you know, now, now Scotty Pippen is talking shit about Jordan saying that he was a horrible player before he came to the bulls. And she's talking about possibly changing her name to Jordan to get married. And, and, and what else is going on? Uh, her ex-boyfriend is now playing on the same team as her son. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. How about that? Imagine showering next to the guy that was fucking your mom. Yeah. yeah. A little weird. A little weird in the locker room and the, the team dynamics. What's your take on this? Larsa Pippen is kicking Scottie Pippen's fucking ass. <laughs> this is the most diabolical shit that has ever... I've never, I've never seen no shit like this. Larsa and Marcus announced that they were having a podcast together. Really? They got a podcast together. Okay. <laughs> and I just went under Marcus's page. Shout out to Marcus and Larsa, man, and just put laughing emotions because they are killing Scottie Pippen. This is so crazy to me. For like, it's like Michael is like a Bond villain. I think Michael is orchestrating all of this. These are Michael is running the fucking triangle office on, on Scotty. I swear to God, bro. I think I think Michael is orchestrating all of this. I, I'm like, I wouldn't be surprised if Michael was sitting back with a cigar, like, tell Marcus, come in here real quick. You love your dad? Yeah. Are you a are you a Jordan? You want to be in that inheritance? Yeah. I got a mission for you. And he just slides him a picture of Larson. You know what I'm saying? It's like, think about this, bro. Think about this. She getting his half of the retirement money. Yeah. Podcast with Michael Jordan's son. Dating Michael Jordan's son. Okay. Michael Jordan's son. And Scotty and Michael are, are into it. I Like, it's so diabolical, it's even sometimes hard to laugh at. Mm. These guys were teammates for years. First of all, Larsa, if this was the other way around, if Larsa were a man... She would be public enemy number one. Oh, yeah. And one. she was dating the younger. Okay, if she was a man and he was dating the daughter of her, of her, of his, of her, of her enemy, of her, okay, of the, the wife's teammate. Yeah. It, right. It, it would be, it'd if, be crazy. If so, so look at it like this. If, if two women are into a beef, two like women on the housewives. And then one of the woman, one of the women starts dating the son, the son of the other woman of the. Uh, that's nuts. Yeah, they're gonna look at her like this bitch is out of her fucking mind. Everybody's gonna say that. Um, I, I really do think when I look at Scotty that I feel bad for Scotty, man, because a couple of things. Number one, Scotty Pippen wasn't a good basketball player. He wasn't a great basketball player. He was an amazing, like, sensational player. Yes. Greatest wing defender of all time. Versatile. John Sally has doubled and tripled down and said Scotty is the most skilled player he's ever played with over Michael Jordan in terms of just raw skill. You can go on YouTube and see what Michael says about Scotty. See what Magic says about Scotty. Jack McCluskey, the general manager of the Detroit Piston, how we thought we're just gonna shut Michael down. We realized we had to shut Scotty down, right? Mm -hmm. um, Horace Grant, Charles Barkley. Did I mention Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. what he said? So, skilled. He plays point guard, shooting guard, small forward, big forward, and center. You can guard anybody on the court. Dennis Rodman. Um, 
can dribble the ball right-handed, left-handed. The fundamentals are built into his swag. I can't argue. Not, not, not everyone agrees yeah, with yeah. it. I just brought, you know, I just interviewed Dennis Rodman. He disagreed, but whatever. Clearly, this guy's a phenom. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, you know, none of that stuff works without Scottie Pippen. Mm -hmm. But they have turned Scottie Pippen in the last five to 10 years into the ultimate cook. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not right. Oh, They've man. turned Scottie Pippen into, into, a into the ultimate cook. They turned him into some guy who was riding Michael Jordan's coattails. He's the cook of the NBA basketball. Then they turned him into a cook for future. Then he got mad. And then they have turned him into a cook for Michael Jordan's son. It would be one thing if Jordan was fucking Larsa Pippen. If Jordan was fucking Larsa Pippen, like, all right. I'd be like, all right, it's all Michael right. Jordan. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, Jordan was like, I don't even have to do it. I'm my, my son, son do it. <laughs> I, it's, it's, I think they playing too dirty. I think they really got to stop. Fuck, I'm going to fuck your wife with my son's dick. Well, yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? I think they playing too dirty. They got to stop. I, like, Larsa and um, uh, Marcus told me that I could come on the podcast. It's like, come on the podcast with everybody. Wait, wait, you got invited to their podcast? He's, so he said, so I, when I put the laughing emojis, he just, he just, he replied, it's like, you're welcome to come on at any time. I DM'd him immediately. I was like, yo, bring me on the podcast. Yeah, you should do it. I'm I, going to, I would do it. I want to talk to them. Yeah. I want to know. They wouldn't have me on, though. I think it'd be a little too raw. Nah, <laughs> bro, I, th that's one time where I got to drop all of my, I got to drop my liberalism because I just, that's, the Marcus Jordan loss of Pippen, it stirs up the inner nigga in me. That, that, that stirs up the toxicity. That makes me toxic masculine when I look at that because I'm like, ain't no fucking way, man. Ain't no fucking way. Uh, but look, God bless them. They seem to be happy. Yeah. They talk about having kids. Ooh. Um, yeah, she's talking about taking this last name. She'll be a Pippin Jordan. <laughs> no, they can't do Lots that, bro. Of Pippin Jordan. They can't do that, bro. She can't go. <laughs> she can do it. But she not. But she got to be lost of Jordan. She can't. You got to get rid of Pippin at that point. I mean, would it surprise you if she did it? Not at this point. <laughs> Not at this point. That's what I'm saying. So what, how, my question is, how can Scotty have revenge? Like, my thing is, what can Scotty do? Can Scotty maybe he, well, get with Juanita Jordan? Yeah, Michael Jordan has daughters, right? Nah, nah, I can't do that. We can't, Scotty can't See, but he'll be viewed as a villain if he did that. Oh, uh, Scotty, yeah, you can't. See, that's Mike, what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, a two-edged, you know, it's a double-edged sword. And, right. and it's, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's. It, he would be seen like he would look like a, a pedophile essentially, even though this woman is like you know full grown. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It'll yeah. it'll be viewed negatively because of the double standard. Well, I have to believe that there is a possibility that Michael and Scotty could be friends again. Sure, I'm gonna give it a nine percent chance <laughs> that Michael and Scotty could bury the hatchet, bro. That's that's wild, man. Kanye, who you've had a lot of experience with, okay, is I guess doing music again. He's apparently married. Yeah, Bianca Sensori. Yeah, yeah. Someone uh, on Twitter said that uh, Kanye married Pete Davidson with titties, and I've I just can't get that out of my head ever since I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> The question is, well, look, um, Adidas has announced that they're basically selling off their back stock in the Yeezys. You yeah, know, people yeah. are like, oh, they're back in business again. They're not back in business again. They're just selling off their old stock and they're donating money to, I guess, the uh, Anti-Defamation League and to George, uh, George Floyd's foundation. So the question is, you know, for example, like I interviewed academics. He said Kanye is one of these guys that can keep fumbling the bag, but he still will get another job. You know what I'm saying? If it's anyone who could still have a finding or, or coming back to grace moment, like Kanye just always seems to survive. I always say, like, when it comes to, like, say, a Kanye, or even, I even said, to, said about Dave Chappelle um, to a certain extent, people sh can't follow those guys. Those guys are unicorns, and a lot of times their bad behavior, actually, if, if, if it's not ignored, sometimes it's rewarded. You get what I mean? If it's anybody else, you're done. It's over.
So that's why you, those those guys are they're not of the mold. Do you think that Kanye could get back into the level that he was at again? Level, which level? What's the level? Number one albums, number one selling sneakers, you know, doing big tours. Kanye drops next week is going to number one. Kanye drops, if Kanye drops, if Kanye drops next week mm -hmm. is going to number one. Like, so there's a part of Kanye now that is probably, that he's never going to return to. I mean, Kanye really, I mean, like, it's it's so weird that I'm saying Kanye really went when he disrespected my ancestors, but you have a Harry Tubman. I have a Harry Tubman right uh, opinion on right now. So there is a version of Kanye that is gone forever, in terms of that. I think that enough people still love Kanye that if Kanye dropped next week, he'd go to number one. He'd go to number one. I also think this. Well, well, okay. Uh -huh. but before before you say that though, see. I think there's a difference between going to number one because of people's curiosity in terms of what he's going to say and what he's going to address. So, for example, Gunner's album went, you know, fairly high in the charts because I think everyone was checking to see what he's going to say about Young Thug, about his own case, everything else like that. Just like Takashi's music went, you know, got a bunch of views initially because people wanted to see whether he's going to address yeah. the, the snitching thing or whatever else. There's a difference between going number one one week because everyone's just tuning in to see the shock value of it to having hit songs that continue to get played and, and embraced and, you know, I mean, marketed and so forth. So let, me just, let, let me just say that. Um, so I think that eventually uh, Adidas and Kanye will work together again. Hmm. You think so? Yeah. Because I don't believe in the continued altruism or moral compass of any corporation. Adidas right now is, is uh, they're struggling for a lot of reasons that aren't Kanye related. Uh, supply side issues that come from uh, the war in Ukraine and come from stuff in China. There are a lot of reasons why, but they would be doing markedly better if, uh, markedly better shall I say, if they had Kanye right now. This is, what, this is what happens with Kanye. And it'll be interesting to see if it happens this time. Kanye goes on a, 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 a prolonged mental bender, whatever you want to call it. He goes on a prolonged rant over the course of a couple of weeks, a couple of months. And everyone goes, I've had enough. Everybody goes, I've had enough. Mm -hmm. Then things settle. Mm -hmm. And incrementally things normalize. Mm -hmm. Incrementally things normalize. Like he just comes back around and you see that it's not a big deal to other people. Like Kanye had a, a, a birthday party out here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And some of the people that went to the party, I, I, was, I was like, wow. I wouldn't think that that person would go to a Kanye West party after Kanye West said that he likes Hitler. You know, I wouldn't think that I would see that person at the party. But is it seems that we only dislike Kanye when we're talking about him. When, when we're talking about him, he's reminding us like who he is now. But when he is not talking, we still think of him as the old Kanye. We still think of him as the sort of off-kilter genius who inspired us so much. It seems like sometimes we don't have the ability to remember uh uh, every single thing that Kanye has done and how they progressively get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, when he goes away and he comes back, like he comes back wearing weird clothes. Now the clothes are the topic of discussion, not the Hitler stuff. The wife is the topic of discussion, not the Hitler stuff. Like all of that stuff is a topic of discussion. We're not, like if you bring up Mel Gibson right now, Someone will still talk about what Mel Gibson said about mm -hmm. Jewish people, what he said about black people. If you bring up Bill Cosby right now, someone will still talk about Bill Cosby and his issues. If all of these people, they, if you bring up Chris Brown right now, someone will still talk about all that. You can have a conversation about Kanye and some of that stuff will never come up. And, I, and, and, so, okay. and, so, my, and so my thing is, if Kanye West 
gifts people. And I'm I'm over it. It's, I'm finished with me. You only got to do a couple, like, I, you know, it's, it's, it's over for me. Like, I'm done. But if Kanye West has six months where he doesn't re remind people of last fall and, and he talks about some of the things that he's learned, he'll be back next year. Middle of next year, he'll be back. He already came out and gave the most interesting apology ever. I watched 22 Jump Street, 21 Jump Street, and I realized not all Jewish people are bad. And so, and so like, people are like, oh, okay, he apologized. And so I'm telling you right now, if there's an opportunity, if Adidas, if Kanye were to drop a song and it were to go to number one, or it, people act like they liked it, and Adidas feels like they can get a billion dollars by working with him again, of course they do it. From my point of view, when I look at this, of course, Adidas lost a lot of money. And of course they could reestablish the relationship only to have Kanye turn around and post a video playing porn to a bunch of the executives only for Kanye to cancel his world tour yeah. during, during a, a hissy fit on stage and really cancel his world tour yeah. only to suddenly say that I love Hitler and Adidas can't do nothing about it. And, and you know, embracing Nazis and saying, I feel the same way, not just about certain Jews, but about all the Jews. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So you deal with someone, and at the end of the day, as much money as Kanye has brought to Adidas, it's still a blip in the overall billions of dollars that Adidas has done as a brand since before Kanye was even born, right? Yeah. Whoever the CEO is of these companies like myself, who's the CEO of a company, looks at this and going, although the short-term money is very attractive, the long-term implications are not. And when you're dealing with someone who is clearly mentally unstable, clearly mentally unstable, unpredictable, you have no idea how what's going to happen that day if he has his phone with him, right. that the potential losses in the future. I mean, imagine they take him back and they announce, yes, Yeezy season 10 is back, whatever else. And they say, hi, I got you. I love Hitler. Fuck y'all. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Fuck the Jews. Like, you know, he's, and that's, that's the whole thing. So I think that Kanye going direct to consumer could go number one mm -hmm. with an album. Kanye direct to consumer could have a, a best-selling sneaker and make millions, if not tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. But I think most corporations who have, because nobody owns these corporations. They're public companies sure. that are run by shareholders. Sure. The CEO is just a CEO. Sure. He answers to the board of directors. The board of directors can kick him out. Right. Look what's happening with Bud Light right now. Right. You know, someone high up at Bud Light thought it was great to have a trans person do a social media campaign. Seems very innocent, right? Let's just embrace, you know, how the world is moving. Inclusion. O only to have Bud Light and Budweiser fall from the number one spot in America's you know, beer consumption. Right. So at the end of the day, I think that he could do well individually, direct direct to his fans, but I think most corporations say it's too much of a risk. Okay. It's too much of a risk. Okay. So that's my theory. I feel you. As a man, you have to you you ultimately have to put your stick down and you have to you have to abide by it. Yeah. You I know, agree. throwing money, throwing money in your face and everything else like that. Listen, Boosie feels a certain types of way about snitches, yeah. right? He wouldn't do a song with Gunna. Right. It doesn't matter if it was a $50 million check. I would ask Boosie the next time he was up here if Gunna paid him $50 million if he'd do a song with him. But I don't know. The I, answer I, would be no. He probably would say no. Okay. You know, he threw away a multi-million dollar deal with T.I. over the whole snitching allegation and also thing, got right? got cool again. He got back cool after they had a conversation and T.I. explained to him that he wasn't actually telling the truth. Right. He was just bringing up a what Chris if kind of situation. And that's why Boosie said, my bad, I apologize, whatever else. It wasn't because he said, okay, I accept the snitching and I need to make this money. Sure. Okay. Right? Cool. Cool. I agree. This is what I'll say. Remember the way I put the Adidas thing out there. Mm -hmm. Adidas in my opinion, doesn't care about what Kanye West has said or done. Like, what Adidas cares about is the public uproar over it. Like, what I was trying to, what I was trying to convince people of, uh, academics even said that companies were making a moral judgment on DeBaby when DeBaby said what he said at Rolling Loud. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't make any sense because DeBaby has rapped about killing black men and doing other stuff and they didn't care about it then. It's actually not true. 
The companies don't care about what they care about. They care about what you care about. Hmm. And what that means is that if the baby is talking about, or any artist, not to single out the baby, but if any artist is talking about killing black people or killing black men or spinning the ops or I'm a smack a bitch or whatever, and we don't care and we buy the music and we show up, they're not going to care. They're not going to moralize over what they think is right in the artist's lyrics. But the moment that somebody does care, they're going to care. Mm -hmm. So the gay and lesbian community went, we don't like that. So we don't like that guy. So we're not going to support that. And anybody that supports that, we're going to make you out to be a homophobe. So the companies went, oh, wait a minute. The audience, a significant part of the audience, 10% of the population, they care. So because they care, we got to act like we care. What I'm saying about Kanye West is we have a problem caring about the bad things that he does. We have a problem over a long period of time maintaining any energy to remember the last time Kanye did something objectionable. And if that continues, and if we're not caring for free, Adidas certainly isn't going to pay a billion dollars to care. What they, what, what's going to have to happen over a long period of time is people are going to have to maintain the opinion of Kanye that they have. And I just don't have any faith, faith that they can do it. I see people talking about him and talking about the stuff with him, and they never bring that shit up. Now, it's fairly recent, so we'll have to see, and we don't know when the shoe's going to fall again. But see if they think that it's over, if they think that Kanye's received help or he's talked about it or he does a run talking about how bad he is, they're definitely going to go back. And, and, and to me, the only reason, the only thing that would stop them, you are the owner of this company and you are making a ethical and moral decision not to interview somebody, right? Mm -hmm. No matter how much money it would bring you. Right. What you said about the corporation is true. Right now, Adidas, their, their shareholders are um, suing Adidas because they have a fiduciary, they, they, they feel like Adidas shirked their fiduciary duty in, in, um, and monitoring Kanye and how he was being and telling right. everybody about it. Yes. I'm telling you right now, if everybody, if if this, if it lasts and Kanye normalizes again and he comes out with hotter shit and Adidas thinks that they can get back $500 million worth of operating profit a year, a billion dollars uh, worth of market cap, uh, like all of that stuff and they have, a, and they come up with some system of fail safes for him, They'll jump back and bail. Fail saves for Kanye. There's no, no way no, you could do it. No they, such thing. The, no such thing. Hollywood. So this is this is fairy so tale. So everything that happened with Mel Gibson, right? Mm -hmm. Everything that happened with Mel Gibson, you would think the one town where you can't do what he did is this town. They nominated for an Academy Award, Hacksaw Ridge. He got nominated for an Academy Award for Best Director, Hacksaw Ridge. Ten years after that happened, you know what I'm saying? And so and so for me, like it, I, I, I get it. Understand? I we talk about outrage and people have so much outrage, but what they don't have is any consistency. They almost always lose it. Well, Mel Gibson never got to anywhere near the level that he was at when he had that outburst. Didn't, and he won't. But what I will you know say- I'm saying? People forget how big of a deal- uh, He was He was, He was. was nearly a billionaire. Yo. Yeah. He might the have last been a The Last Temptation, not The Last Temptation of Christ. Um, um, uh, passion the, of the Passion of the Christ. Was a phenomenon. And he, and he, and he that was his movie, and he self funded it too. Self funded it, basically. It was a phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, Braveheart, like like these he was movies. The man. He was, but also some of that was waning anyway because he was getting older. But but he but, no, but I, I yeah but, 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 he, but, he was, but but he was the man. But, but what I'm no, saying not. is is that th he fell off that cliff, and yeah, he he managed to get out the rocks a little bit and, and wade around in the water. But that cliff. <laughs> I don't think it Kanye was never, like, like was I said, never to be returned to. Like I, like I said, I don't think Kanye will ever get back to where he to the apex of who he was. But I just do not have any faith in people's ability to stay mad at him. No, I, I get it, and people won't stay mad at him, and people will forget. And hit songs and, and nice fashion will will make people forget. And, and you know, repeat. oh, that was a long time ago. I didn't even know that people are born; they don't even know about this shit. But the thing is that when you're dealing with an unstable person. You're dealing with someone who's who's ready to throw it all away because they're just having a bad day. You can't do business with a person like that. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, 
There is a number of people, of people on Vlad with. TV that have brought getting, millions yeah, and millions of views that people hit me up. Can you please bring this person back? Can you please blah, 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 blah. And the person is just, he's a liability. He or she is a liability. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they do insane shit. You know what I mean? They, 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 I've talked about this before. And at, the, at one day, at one point you just say, Yes, it's cool. You know what I mean? Like you mentioned, you know, how come I don't bring porn stars anymore? It's like, hey, listen, we had our time and we've interviewed some porn stars that got millions of views, but we ultimately didn't want to have Vlad TV be like a porn podcast kind of platform. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We just felt- you miss, we, It's a whole new generation. You're missing them, bro. Okay, so I'm missing him and that's okay. And Adam has done great with it. Shout out to Adam and No Jumper. He yeah. he's a I mean he does porn himself, so he's fully embraced this whole kind of thing. Yeah. For us, it's like listen, as we mature as a company, as we grow, as you know, we we get people like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Shaka Khan or you know Dennis Rodman recently or you know Smokey Robinson and everything else like that. Ultimately when people do these Googles and they decide whether or not they want to accept these interviews, we didn't want a whole bunch of porn stuff to be the first thing that came up because that's the stuff that gets the most views. Right. You see what I'm saying? So shout out to all the porn stars out there and everything else like that. I've never spoken negatively about this yeah, profession or anything else like that. Yeah. It's just for us, it's just not the platform for us to keep moving with it. And there's lots of other platforms. Yeah. So, so I think Adidas... And I mean, because he's not even on Universal Records anymore, I don't think. Like all the major, you know, he's not with Gap, he's not with Balenciaga, all the corporations, the corporations, not the people, but the corporations said, it's not worth the trouble. The money's going to talk. The money, yes, but, you I, know, look, when you, look, when you look, invest if, a bunch if, of money and you suddenly well, have to take Remember what I'm saying, everything. remember what I'm saying. I'm saying, if the people come back, the corporations will. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying if the people come back, the cor I'm, I'm off of it. Like it just got, it, it, I'm, I'm, but you know me, I, I'm, I'm off of it. But if yeah. the people come back, the corporations will. Yeah, I mean, listen, you had your Kanye moment. You, you stood your ground. You don't regret anything that you said or did. Uh, you and Kanye are not best friends. That's not uh, true. <laughs> are you and Kanye are friends? No, oh no, oh no, no. I thought you said we are now best friends. No, you are not best no, friends. No, no, we're not best friends. I'm like, whoa, what did I miss? No, 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 no. we're not best friends. <laughs> right, you're not best friends. Listen, Kanye, Kanye, uh, we got offered a Kanye interview at one point. Uh, after all the Hitler stuff and everything else like that. And it was like, okay, do we take it? Do we not take it? And, you know, my plan was, all right, well, we're not going to pass it up, but we're going to take it. But the plan is, is that when he sits down, I just, I'm going to talk to him about his music. And if he tries to steer the conversation, I'm going to steer it right back to the music. And if it chose it's not going to happen. I know it's not, it was it probably wasn't going to happen, yeah. but I figured it was at least worth a try. Right. You know, but they ended up canceling our interview and a bunch of other interviews that same week because yeah. I think it was- Because I think he was going to a couple of different places. Yeah, the whole Proud Boys interview came out and which yeah. made it even worse for him and he just ended up canceling everything. But, you know, listen, I understand the the importance. I've interviewed Kanye before, before, mm -hmm. before Flat TV. You know, I can't, I ended up throwing the interview away at one point accidentally, but it was like an audio interview. You know, he was, in the, he was doing uh, Kanye's uh, comments album at the time. Kanye's been Kanye this whole time. The way he was back then with like the, the egotistical and, you know, kind of methodology is, is still the same, same person. Yeah, same but, you know, kind of like I said, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to uh, to control the interview and I probably would have had to probably scrap it. I mean, I have a yeah. I have an R. Kelly interview that I never put out. You know what I mean? Because the whole interview was about him blaming bloggers for the reason why he's there and blaming a judge for illegally leaking this. And my thing was like, I don't want to put out, you know, an R. Kelly interview try to promote his conspiracy theories of right. why he's there because I feel he's there for a, a valid reason. Right. You I know mean, what I'm saying? I'm not here to try to spring R. Kelly out of prison. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, right. now- It has to be nutritious if you're gonna say that. Yes, now if he wants to talk about his career, mm -hmm. then yeah, but he didn't, there was none of that in the interview. Right, so, it's damage control. Yeah, the interview was, was ultimately scrapped. Right. You know, and that's what I'm saying. Like, regardless of the views and the money mm -hmm. and uh, the attention, it's like, all right, I'm going to throw away, which potentially could be tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, mm -hmm. because you, you ultimately have to have values in your business. You know what I'm saying? Um, I know you got to go soon. I just want to do a couple of uh, RIPs at the end. Gangster Boo, it was recently announced that she died of fentanyl. Mm -hmm. and uh cocaine this was actually someone i was very cool with she had been in my house before yeah i was cool with her too yeah yeah man uh fentanyl's a motherfucker yeah the, the worst thing out there these days it man. is uh, fentanyl's the worst thing out there i'm telling like in terms of the fentanyl 
like obviously some of the some of the street drugs are laced with it, but you know, guys, even supplements that people order offline mm. that they're taking for different things um, have fentanyl in them. Wow! Uh, everybody just be like unbelievably vigilant about what it is that you put into your body. But even more so than that, I want people to understand um, uh, like what Lola meant to rap. Period. Yeah. Uh, what what um who she was and, and, and what she did and, and how important she was. I, I want people to understand what Memphis means. You know what I'm saying? Like what Memphis means to rap. Memphis has, um, I'm not from Memphis. Memphis has an amazing rap scene now, of course. Um, there been some losses lately, obviously, uh, with, with Dolph's passing mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Pusha Icy going to jail and there's like, but, but Memphis has always been one of the most important cities in rap. Uh, coming from Baton Rouge, having my homeboy Gino that was from Black Haven and listening to a lot of that music. Uh, it was just incredibly influential, very important. And she was right there at the forefront of it. Like 100%. the first lady of it all. She is very important. Um, her life was very important. Uh, gone too soon. So much love to her and to the city of Memphis for, for what they've meant to hip hop. Yeah, and uh, rest in peace, Jackie O, who was uh, the child's mother of uh, DC Young Fly. Uh, I've interviewed DC a couple times. Um, great spirit, great guy. Um, to have the mother of his three kids die, uh, you know, after getting plastic surgery. I mean, he's done some interviews recently and he's he was at the funeral with like a smile on his face. I don't know how he's doing it. Honestly, watching him right now, I don't know how he's just not breaking down in tears. Can I, can, I, can I give what I think the answer is? Please. God. He's religious. So I had DC on the pod podcast, um, the Red Pill, the older podcast, right, mm -hmm. um, from before. Yeah. And even when I talked about, because I was, I was, I think I was joking around, I was like, uh, like women this or women that, or I know the girls be whatever, whatever. And he was saying, Miss Jackie O, Miss Jackie O, he was shouting out the name of his girl. And when I was in DC's presence, it strikes me sometimes with brothers that they don't recognize a lot of times the anointing that they have on them, if I would get religious for a second, or what their star power really is or why people connect with them so much, or why a spirit exudes off of them and the people that are around them. Particularly when I'm talking about my Southern black people who we've been around each other, we've had to laugh through certain things, we've had to find ways to kind of um, uh, ground ourselves and center ourselves and extract joy out of situations. Uh, that mirror like where we come from. When you're sitting around someone and they just make you feel good. The whole 85 South crew, like those guys, when you sit, when you see somebody, they're, just, they're up there and they just make you feel good. Yeah. They make you feel um, happy, like you laughing. And he was telling stories about how he used to come into a room and get the room turned up and like bang on the, um the, and rap and sing. And that people don't understand and a lot of my people don't understand sometimes when we talk about that, we call it talent, but that's the God in you. That's what's flowing from the divine, from your source, from how we've had to tap into who and what we are in order to make ourselves feel good um, and feel whole about our, our, uh, our situation and our perch here. And when I watched him talk and when I watched him uh, express himself after he lost his woman, I felt that same thing exuding off of him. I felt something that is uncommon and something that I couldn't do when my dad died. I felt his need to make other people comfortable with the fact that he was going to be okay. Not that he was okay now, not that he was doing good now, but that his children were gonna be okay and that he was gonna be okay. And I've seen women do this for years, and I've seen people, um, black women do this for years, and we ask them to do it, they shouldn't have to do it. 
And I've, I've seen people who are really grounded in their source be able to do this for years. When my father died, I couldn't do it. When my father died, it was important for me to tell people I might never be okay again. Yeah. Like I couldn't give them any comfort in the fact that I was going to be all right. Now I am all right. But yeah. when, like when I, when, I, when I saw him, I was like, he's going to be good. And his children are going to be good. They never, they'll never be the same, mm. but they'll be good. And me and DC have talked and we talk every once in a while. I mean, I remember when I, the last text message, the last DM I got from him was when my father died. Mm. He said, yo, man, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? It's not like, we're not like boys like we talk all the time. We know each other through the industry circles, through following each other, through stuff like that. But I'm um, as, as, as gutting as it was for anybody who loves those guys and, and who is a big fan of DC, it was also very important that he was able to carry it the way that he did. And and um, his strength was admirable, and it's just my heart goes out to him and his children. Yeah, I, I can't imagine the conversation that he had with his kids. It actually makes me tear up when yeah. I think about it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't imagine telling three kids that their mom is not coming back. Babies, man. Some one, yeah, one was a baby, and the other one, you know, sort of, I don't know, like about four or five years old. Another one looked like a little bit older. Yeah, we call them babies. Yeah, they're babies. all babies. You're a yeah. baby until you're about 15. <laughs> you're a baby until you're 15. <laughs> you know, before I let you go, you had a book that you dropped, I think, since our last interview, uh, mm -hmm. Fat, Crazy, and Tired, Tales from the Trenches of Transformation. You actually seem thinner. I lost weight. Yeah, I lost about 40 pounds. 40 pounds? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, I lost about 40 pounds. Good for you. I, yeah. I've lost 30 pounds myself. Yeah, you're keeping it I off, keep, too. I, I'm good. keeping yeah. it off. I actually, you know, I, I mentioned this in my academics interview. I actually played around with Ozempic and Wegovy. I was, it was actually prescribed to me by my uh, cardiologist. Uh-huh. And... Uh, I tried it for a couple of months. It just made me nauseous and just yeah, constipated like all the time. I didn't like it. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Like there, there's other ways I've been working out heavily. Yeah. Like I, I figure out how to play video games on my treadmill and that just transformed everything. Right. I thought video games were the worst times in people's lives. Exactly. Unless, <laughs> unless, unless, now if you're sitting in your bed. I can't believe how bad people were. I know, right? And if you're sitting in bed, you know, eating a pizza and nachos while you're playing video games, then yeah, you're wasting your fucking life. If I'm actually on the, but I can do, I can knock off two hours on the treadmill and burn like oh, a, over a thousand calories playing while, while playing Slay the Spire on my Xbox right. in my home gym. That is dope. And, and that's actually the reason why I'm still thin without having to use, you know, and listen, the, the Wegovy Ozempic thing only happened for a couple months. I've, I've been thin for like three years now. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I just tried it out for a couple months. I didn't like it. It made me nauseous and constipated. And I just, ugh. you know what I mean? It, that's how they get you to lose weight because you just don't want to eat because you're nauseous all the time. Right. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but by, you know, keeping track of my calories and now having a serious workout routine by using video games, mm -hmm. I'm now 195 pounds. The calculus that you you find out for you know what yeah. for your body you find out what works. Yes. You know what's been getting me is is like, I used to always play a lot of ball to stay in shape, mm. and then when the pandemic came, I stopped playing ball because there's nowhere to play. Um, I kept boxing, which I box now. Nice. Uh, but being in the gym and lifting has been important for me. Yeah. Lifting has been really important. And it's also like, bruh, I felt, I used to think I was strong, man. I'm a big dude. And there were times in my life where I was strong, but I would be in there and my, my I, you know, I work with a trainer. And so I'm in there and I'm lifting. I'm like, oh, on the deadlift. I'm like, oh. Jesus Christ, man, the strongest man around. And then like <laughs> a lady will walk up, be like, are you finished with that? I was like, yeah, just let me wrap, let me take them off real quick. And she's like, no, you don't have to take them off. And she said, <laughs> she'll do your weight. <laughs> you don't take them off. It's good. Yeah, I'll start, I'll, I'll start with this. And I'm like, and then boom, oh, I'm like, oh, you're really strong. Yeah, I, but, I, but I'm getting stronger and yeah. like, that is helping me so much boxing. Yeah. I'm hitting harder. I got more lateral movements helping me on the basketball court, and I'm feeling better. I'm yeah. bending over better. I'm, you know, get, it's, it's it's important as you get older. Yeah, I mean, I started doing 100 uh, push-ups a day. Okay, good. And sets nice. of 25. That's dope. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't have a full bench press at home, so I had to kind of figure out what to do. That's but full like, body strength. That's efficient. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, between between doing a couple hours on a treadmill every day and you know starting to get my, you know, I'm doing curls, and like, listen, man, I'm I'm going to turn 50 in one week, Happy and, and at 50. I'm in the best shape of my life. 
I have the best relationships of my life. It's amazing. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm the most financially stable mm-hmm. of my life. I have the best business that I've ever started. And, and I've started you got a multiple future ahead of you for all, for all to get better. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I look at other 50-year-olds, man, and it's just like, God damn, they look like they're 70. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, all types of, you know, pro- health problems, you know, weight problems, uh, and so forth. And it's like, yo, like I'm actually thin, like, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looked like I, I looked in high school, like, you know what I'm saying? Cause I took it seriously. My, um, one of the guys, there's a guy I go to the gym with Al. Al is a fantastic trainer out here. He's a basketball player. He plays over at the Equinox over there on Sepulveda. Al was telling me that people talk about quantity of life, but it's not about quantity. It's about quality. Right. Yeah. So he was saying, you want to live to 85, cool. You want to live to 90, cool. But the question is, how many good years do you have? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? How many, like, my dad didn't have a long life. Um, how long did he live to? 66. My dad lived to 84. Okay. Yeah. Um, 66 my, is pretty young, man. My dad dealt with congestive heart failure uh, since he was about 44 years old. He really beat the odds in how long he was able to live with it. It normally gets you in about five years. But um, so when I look at the things that he liked to do and how he liked to be, he liked to hunt, he liked to shoot, he liked to, you know, uh, fish. You know, I love to do those things. I just picked up another gun. I'm going gun crazy again. I don't know why. <laughs> and um, but I just want to be able to be virile and be active and be in the game for as long as I can. And to do that, you got to work for it like anything else. Oh, oh, yeah. Like, I remember Michael Jai White, who I really look up to when it comes to health. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like a great grandfather right now, and he's older than me and is in way better shape. And I remember one of our interviews a couple of times ago, I said, what is, what is your secret to staying in the type of shape that you're in? And I expected this big convoluted answer and these details and between diet and working out. And he just simply said, your body is the only thing you truly own. That's it. Your body. Nothing else. Not your things, not your women, not even your kids. All those things could ultimately be taken away from you. Your body is all you have. And there's going to be a point in time where we're all going to have to use a cane or be in a wheelchair. I saw him say this on your show. Yeah. Yeah. Or something like that. And he's trying to push that day back as long as humanly possible. I mean, your body, your health is the only thing that you really own that somebody can't take away from you. So I kind of look at it like uh, it's it's nothing about kind of just this discipline thing. It's it's I get to do it. I get to train. I have the right like, you know, this is a right for everybody. Hmm. And people talk about like, oh, I don't have time. Like, OK, l- let's put these things together here, because you say you don't have time to, you know, to put into your health. I would argue that taking care of yourself gives is the only thing that gives you more time. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Yeah, because, you know, you have more time on this planet at a better quality of life. Yeah. So you don't have time to work. Well, okay, you're going to have less time than you know. So to me, that to me, it makes a lot of sense. The fact that one day I'm going to have a cane and I'm going to wish I could run. I'm going to wish I could get out of here and go work out. I will give everything I own to be able to do that one day. But guess what? I can do it right now. And I'm like, damn, that's such a great way to think about it. This totally nonspecific. Yeah. And it's just, and you could tell, and like I've been around him. Like he's my actual friend. Like mm-hmm. he lives right around here. Like been to his house a ton of times. And he, that's really how he is. He looks at it, yeah. Yeah, like it's not a, it's not, it's not because of what he's, you know, it's not because the cameras are on. He really, really lives this way. And I would expect him to say some wild shit, like, I work on my body so that I can crush a man's windpipe <laughs> in my bare hands, <laughs> a strike like a cobra. That dude's so fucking fast, bro. Oh, yeah. I watch some of the videos. I want. I, I tell you why I do it because I gotta train this muscle right here so I can strike like a cobra <laughs> and crush a man's whip. <laughs> One more thing before I let you go. Cool. What happened between you and uh, Emmanuel Acho? Oh, shit. Because um, so, that whole thing happened since our last interview. Okay. Okay, so this is what happened between me and Emmanuel Acho. And let me just say this right now. I do not think Emmanuel Acho is a bad guy. 
Okay. I don't think that he's a bad guy. There is something that exists in America, in most places, right? Nobody really wants to be challenged on anything, not even me. I think that I'm a good person and I think that I'm doing my best. And so because I'm doing my best, when I see people challenge me sometimes, I take I take the, their challenges as being adversarial. Hmm. Um, and I have to do that all the time. I might say something in this interview right now that people don't agree with and that they might push me to be better. Mm -hmm. And so just like that, like America doesn't want to be challenged. America, what, what America really wants is for there to be black people to tell them that everything is going to be okay. And you would think that it would be America that would be telling black people that everything would be okay. But no, they want there to be enough black people to say that, hey, we know that these things happen to us, but we're putting them behind us. We're moving on and we're going to get there together. And we don't need anything from you guys. We'll figure it out, right? The worst type of black person you can be to me is that person, right? The worst type of black person you can be is that person because that person is normally well-meaning, right? The, the person that, that says, hey, I, I want to make you as a, a society um, and as a government and as an entity feel better about the things that have happened so that you don't have to hear what we have to say to you and how we can really achieve uh, the ideals that you claim to keep, right? To me, that's the worst type of black person that you can be. That's the worst type of person that you can be, right? Because if right now, if if you go to the doctor and you're sick, uh, if the doctor treats you poorly, like if he treats your sickness poorly, mm -hmm. at least you'll get a little bit better. The worst thing that the doctor can do for you is tell you that you're not sick. Yeah. If the doctor tells you that you're not sick, the doctor is assuring that you'll either suffer or die. Yeah. And I've had that happen to me. I've had skin cancer and my initial doctor said that it's- It's not that big of a deal. It's not right? that big of a deal. So only to go to a specialist to find out it's skin cancer, it's they got to operate right they away. They got to operate, right? Yeah. So that doctor that didn't um, that didn't do that could have sentenced you uh, to, it, it could have been, I'm not going to but that could have been a death died. sentence. I, I could have died, yeah. You could have died, right? Yeah. All those skin cancers relatively easy to relatively treat, relatively easy to treat, but totally untreated, it could have killed me. It could yes. have killed you, right? So that's the worst thing. And so the worst thing that we can do for Americans, as America, is make them feel okay about what's happened to Black people. What I felt like was either wittingly or unwittingly that Emmanuel Acho was doing that. That when you have a conversation on uncomfortable conversations with Black men, and you don't challenge the status quo, you don't challenge the police, that you, I watched him have a, a conversation with the police where he essentially let the police tell their side of the story. Right, and Emmanuel Acho, he's Nigerian? He's Nigerian, yeah, he's Nigerian Immigrant. American. He's an, uh, I think he was born here. He was born here, okay. But I think he might be second or third generation. I don't know okay, his got background it. as much. Got it. So, um, and then I watched another interview with Roger Goodell where he, it, it's it's collegial, it's whatever, there's, he has a he had a platform called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, where he was having these conversations that everyone says you need to need to have, and only people that seemed to be uncomfortable was the people that are watching it, and not the people that are in the seat answering for either white America, the police, or any of those other things. And I had an issue with it, right? Um, that doesn't make him out. That doesn't mean he's a demon. That doesn't mean that he is a uh, uh, somehow a part of a cabal of people that are trying to 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 erase progress. That just means that I didn't like that shit and the way that it was going. And I looked it up. He he actually was born in Dallas to Nigerian to Texas. Nigerian parents. He's from Nigerian Texas. immigrants. Nigerian yeah. immigrants. So he's from exactly. Texas. Yeah. Um and so when he was coming on the podcast, he's a friend of Rachel's, Rachel, my co-host. Mm -hmm. When he was coming on the podcast, I wanted to have a conversation with him about that. About what I feel like the responsibility of black people is uh to be able to challenge things like this. And I want to make sure that people understand this about me when I say this. Um, I have been a white man's nigga before. I have. Meaning? Meaning that when I first got to TMZ, uh, I was concerned about being on television. I've always in my life been deeply, deeply invested into the the uh condition of black people in this in this country 
Anyone who knows me will, 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 will tell you that. I've always been that way. When I first got to TMZ, television changed me a little bit early on. Television changed me because what I was trying to do was be the cool black guy in that room. I really wanted to be. I wanted to be the cool black guy in the room. I was um, a part of, of, a, uh, of a television show. I'd been in LA for around five or six years at that point, and it was a huge opportunity for me at that point. Um, and so I let my guard down a little bit. So I went from one, for, and, and if you do that, if you let your guard down uh, in order to get along with white people or go along with white people, you are being a white man's nigga. There's no doubt about it. You are, okay? Um, I wasn't purposefully doing it, but it was happening anyway because I wanted to be the cool dude. I wanted to be the one that talked about rap, the one that talked about this. I wanted to be all of that. What ended up happening was the situation that I was in there sparked inside of me the need to be disruptive there. As disruptive as you can be. Because to a degree, if you're there, you're there, right? But when I looked around and saw that I wasn't in a room full of um, avocado toast eating Hollywood liberals where it was all good. I realized that even though I had left Louisiana and come out to LA, I wasn't in some utopia. I was in a place that had the same type of, same types of issues that I was already used to. And so, Van, you gotta be yourself. You gotta be Van. You gotta be Van. Whatever damage you've done to your reputation for some people, for who you are, it doesn't matter. You gotta be Van. You have to be Van. All right. So I ended up being Van, maybe a little bit too much Van. And um, and so, you know, it didn't work. It, it didn't work out in the end. But, you know, I find myself, I find my voice. So when I see a situation where I feel like someone is unwittingly doing harm, I understand what it feels like. I understand that sometimes you don't mean it. And I understand that sometimes it comes off to other people differently than it comes off to you. I've been there. So when I talk to them, my approach was probably not as genteel as it needed to be, but it was to let them know that, hey, you have an opportunity to really penetrate a, a part of American society and culture that I can't get to because they already know that I'm angry, right? Where things went left is that he said that he was better equipped to have those conversations because he didn't have generational trauma from slavery because he is Nigerian-American. Nigerian parents, yeah. Because the proximity that I have to the experience in America that makes me want things to be better, which is slavery, Jim Crow, being a Southern black man, that in some way weakens me to ask for my freedom in a way that he's not weakened, that he, he has a stronger, better way of doing it because he doesn't have that type of deal. Hmm. That doesn't work. That is not only divisive, but it's idiotic. Uh, and it actually does a disservice to his own ancestors and where he comes from and the generational trauma that uh, that I've come to learn about that existed um, on the continent and what colonialism and imperialism did to those people and how things are even there now. But when I heard it, what I hear sometimes is what a lot of black Americans hear is that I'm not from here, so I'm better than you. Let me talk to them about you. Let me talk to them about what you've gone through. I don't need nobody to speak for me. Mm. Like what I need is for you to speak, to speak with some power, some authority, and some intent. And we can talk about what the ways that are. We can talk about ways that I speak that are less than productive. We could talk about ways that I speak that might not be far enough for some people. 10 people are gonna watch this, three people are gonna say Van is a coon, and the, the other seven are gonna say Van needs to calm it down. Or three will say Van needs to calm it down, and then in the middle, you're gonna have other people that say, hey, Van's doing too much. It's like, whatever, it's the way that it goes, right? Um, I was unfair to him in that I went on the attack rather then try to pull him into my tent and have him understand where I was coming from. I don't think that Emmanuel Acho is a bad guy or that he means black people harm. I think that he, like he said during that interview, is doing it the way he thinks that it needs to be done. 
what I would caution him or anybody else from doing is othering yourselves from a group and then saying you're speaking for that group. Hmm. Othering yourselves from Black Americans who are the descendants of enslaved people, whether you call that Eidos, FBA, Black, Louisianian, from Tampa, Florida, wherever you're from, right? Othering yourself from that group and then saying you need to speak for that group. Because what ha- what's, ha- what's been happening to that group of people since we've been here is somebody else has been telling us what we need and who we are. And I am not prepared to let anybody do that, even if they share the same skin color as me. That's deep. <laughs> that's, that's definitely deep. <laughs> that, that was definitely a very involved, expansive answer to my question. But I'll Bravo. say this. Uh, but, but, Very well said. But I mean, I, 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 I yeah, I, I can't even really put in my two I'll, cents I'll, at this I'll point. I'll say this. You, you covered it completely. Yeah. I own when I come across in ways that are less than nutritious or, or, or less, than, um, less than constructive. And it probably wasn't one of my best moments. Well, I, I could say this. I'm actually a first generation immigrant. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you were born... Wait, what? I was, I was you were born, born oh born, yeah, you were born in I was born Kiev, in you Ukraine, just, right. Yeah, I was yeah, born yeah. in Ukraine. It was part of the USSR, which is yeah. why I, I call myself Russian and uh-huh. so forth. And there is just a fundamentally different point of view of America that an immigrant or a second generation immigrant will have versus someone that was actually born in this country. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's so it, it just runs so deep with the way that things are viewed as, you know, because at the end of the day, America is sold to the world as the land of opportunity. Sure. No other country is sold this way. Indonesia is not the land of opportunity. You know, Afghanistan is not the land of opportunity. There's only one land of opportunity on the whole planet and it just happens to be America. And I think that as an immigrant, that essentially supersedes your entire view of America. And I think as someone who was born in America or, you know, I mean, he was born in America, but he still comes from an immigrant family that still has that ethos, that, yeah. that ethos and yeah. that and that baseline view of this country that someone that was born in this country and may feel that they didn't get the opportunities that they deserve as someone who was born in this country and whose ancestors helped build this country. An immigrant just doesn't think that way. They look at it a little bit differently. And it's not from an animosity or a looking down point of view. It's just a completely different perspective, which is why, you know, I think as a whole immigrants, I think as a group, I haven't looked this up, but I think ultimately they do a little bit better than people who are not immigrants. Well, I mean, there there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, One obviously has to do with somebody's ability to... Uh, intentionally come to a country rather than to be subject to, subjected to exactly. generations of whatever. So, exactly. you know, you start off in a different way. There are different kind of metrics yeah. for all of that stuff. I mean, academics is an immigrant. You right. know, he's a Jamaican immigrant. You right. know what I'm saying? And and listen, and listen, and, and as an immigrant, we also get bashed for being immigrants. Sure. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, I don't know how many times I've seen, like, look at Vlad and academics, two non-American immigrants who are coming over here making money off of American right. culture. So, so, so it's like, we get attacked for being immigrants and having immigrant mentality as well. So sometimes you come off as defensive and so forth. And then so, sometimes yeah. people think that they're better than, than exactly. So, so, exactly. So I personally don't think that I'm any better than anybody, right. but some so, people do think that so they're better. So what, what I would say then is like, even within the diaspora, even within people, I just did Afrikan um, last week. And yo, man, I said when I, when I, when I was up there doing Afrikan, like I want to be connected to Africa. I want to be, um, I want a part of my story to be my ancestry. Mm-hmm. My, when I talk about my ancestors, I'm specifically talking about the people that were enslaved here that made the sacrifices they made for so that I could be a part of American culture and have whatever uh, amount of freedom I have right now. Um, but I want to be a part of the deep lineage and the importance of African people to this world. African people invented vaccination. Mm. I want to be a part of pe- the people that invented vaccination, that figured out how to slow down sp- smallpox. 
Um, and even a story like that, right? Give you an example real quick before I go about how cutting somebody's knowledge of self off affects the entire world. Okay. So what African people have meant to the world has been downplayed, right? And because of that, people feel cut off from things that are inherently theirs or that they had a part in making. So when we have a conversation about vaccination, and I'm not pushing anything on anybody, you do whatever you want with your body, right? Like read a pamphlet, read a book, whatever, do whatever you want with your body. Yeah. Um, you'll hear somebody say a white man's vaccine, white science, whatever. Okay. That's because they don't have an understanding of the part that their people played in vaccination. Mm -hmm. Edward Jenner, who is the father of vaccination, who is so-called, um, from England, uh, had a process done when he was a kid called variolation. Variolation is when you take, um, you get variolated, you take uh, parts of smallpox, right? And you give it to somebody, take a little bit of pus from a smallpox scab, and you give it to somebody when they're a kid. They might have a small smallpox outbreak, but then for the rest of their life, they're immune. Mm -hmm. This was done in Africa, as variolation, it was done in India and Asia as insufflation. You take the scabs and you smoke them. Hmm. Okay, so Edward Jenner um, uh, gets variolated when he's a child and he doesn't get smallpox. All right, so he knows that. There are records of slaves over here in America variolating their owners so that they don't get smallpox, like saving the lives of the people that enslaved them. It's, something, it's, it's a way that African people figured out how to slow a disease that was killing hundreds of millions of people. All right. So Edward Jenner then says, all right, well, if that works for smallpox, uh, I wonder if we can use it and add technology to it. So he sees that milkmaids that work with cows, they would get cowpox. Cowpox was a, uh, a more mild form of smallpox. But when they got cowpox, they didn't get smallpox. Hmm. Vodka, vaccine, vodka, that means cow. Okay. So what he did was he took what they were able to, what they were able to, he, he took somebody, variolated them using cowpox, and then they didn't get smallpox. He watched them, watched the kids. They didn't get smallpox. Supposing them smallpox, they didn't get it. All right. After that, he found a way to take animal parts uh, of the cow, uh, put it with, uh, whatever he needed to, and all of a sudden he invents a smallpox vaccine, something that you can give to somebody. By 1980, smallpox is eradicated. Here's the thing. From the time that he did it to the time that smallpox was eradicated, technology had changed. But the idea and the use of the natural world to spread and stop a disease came from African people. And because they're cut off from their science and what they've been able to do in this world, it's easy for someone to say, hey, this isn't for you. This is from somebody else. Then comes a time where you need them to take their, you need them to take a vaccine. And they say, no, because we don't trust the government. Not that they should. I'm not pushing a vaccine on anyone. I'm not saying anyone should get any types of vaccines or do anything like that. But what I'm saying is, don't think that's not you. Don't think astronomy isn't you. Don't think all of these things aren't you. They are. And what happens is when we get into pools like this between Black Americans and people from the continent where things are divisive, what we're really doing is splitting our history. So don't tell me you're any better than me and I won't tell you I'm any better than you. You could listen to 21 Savage and I'll listen to Burner Boy. If we're the same, let's be the same. But if we're not the same, then get the fuck out of my way like everybody else. That's how we're going to end it. <laughs> ben Lathan, always a pleasure. Until next time. Appreciate you. Buddy. Peace. <laughs>